Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. My name is Rob H., and this week I am here with... Lee Overstreet, once again, pinch hitting on the AV Rant podcast for for Tom, who is away this week. Yeah, Tom is away this week. He uh, mentioned last week uh, doing some headphone reviews. Those will have to wait until next week. Uh, Tom is away, and thankfully, Lee was able to uh, join us. So thank you, Lee, for once again coming in on not super short notice this time. He had a a couple days notice. Oh, I had had some time this time. Uh, Doesn't mean I, you know, do all of my due diligence (laughs) as I should, but... I mean, there's uh, only so much you can do. I got the uh, show notes uh, finished about an hour before we were supposed to start that's so right. we're leaving it down to the wire there but that's how, that's how it goes that's okay you know they're one of the reasons i love taking part in this is it really does have a similar feel to the college radio show mm-hmm. i used to do back in the day where there was some planning and a whole lot of wing in it and it was a beautiful thing <laughs> very natural just going for it at any given time and i'm also just i'm kind of i don't know dare i say relaxed this week because oh, yeah, uh, you know, my wife had surgery last week, ah. and uh, so that's been, I am Captain Anxiety, and that's been very stressful, I but uh, she's sure doing enough. great, and and so I'm feeling better about that. If she isn't doing well, I'm not doing well. It's one of those things. And then I, I see you have pictures of your apartment, right? Like, uh, progress is being made? There is progress to be made. I mean, before we get all that, it's been uh, at least a few weeks, a month, I don't know, more yeah. than a month since Lee was here last time, so uh, yeah, I guess he gave a little bit of update there, but but how the heck are you? Otherwise, I haven't really talked to you too much in the past little yeah. while. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm okay now. There was just, there's been a lot of stress. We had some work done on the house that cost thousands, and so that was stressful, and then again, my wife had surgery, that's stressful, uh, but things are starting to relax, like... Nothing bad is happening right now. Oh, oh, good, Lee. Just say that out loud in a recorded (laughs) format. Couldn't possibly jinx anything by saying that. Between you and Tom and myself, there have been some pretty heavy things go on in the past month or so between a hurricane and injuries for Tom and you had a family thing, health problems, and you had your apartment all this time. Uh, It's just been a heck of a time and, and things come in waves. So I think we're about to have a great time for the rest of this year. Haven't we been saying that for about five years? In any case, uh, yeah, <laughs> let's let's hope you're correct, Lee. Let's let's I hope think that's I am. true. <laughs> and uh, yeah, as as alluded to, some progress has been made on my apartment. I'll show a few pictures here on YouTube, yeah. and you can follow along in the Flickr album that'll be in the show notes for this uh, episode over at avrant.com. So uh, yeah, their painting has been done. Drywall's complete. Uh, painting yeah. of the ceiling and uh, walls is done. You might notice uh, that's a gray theater now. In fact, I love the colors. By I the really way. love it. That is uh, Sherwin Williams Software. Uh, that is one of the oh. shades within that gray screen family that we mention all the right. time on this podcast. This is one shade darker than what Tom got in his theater, which was uh, okay. Network. So they all have those types of names. Uh, yeah. Right. So this is the Software shade in a velvet sheen. So uh, pretty pretty close to matte. It's one it- step above the matte finish there. So I'm I'm really really happy with that part of it. And they did a nice job on the ceiling too, which uh, the ceiling in the den has always been kind of crappy. So uh-huh. I'm happy to finally have a smooth, proper looking ceiling in there. I just left it white. I know some people are like, oh my goodness, theater for Rob. And he's got a white ceiling, but you know, I'm using an OLED, not a projector. So I'll live with the white right. ceiling. I will be selling this place one day. So I'm not going to go painting the ceiling black in my den. Yeah, um, that, the that rest... gets a little nuts with buyers. But <laughs> I also like the tan color in the other room. That's that's the way it was when I bought it. Yeah. And since it looks only some of the walls needed to be repaired and were therefore going to be painted regardless they weren't going to paint all the walls so i didn't want to leave like part of it tan and i've got sort of a dark uh br- a brownish red on one of the walls there so left all mm-hmm. that the same didn't uh, request any changes there flooring uh is beginning uh yeah. tomorrow as we're recording this so that's uh that's going to be a good time and yeah happy to see all the progress being made and uh for anyone uh, i know people have been asking like oh hey uh how about your equipment what got damaged what's getting replaced yeah. i still don't know still don't oh, know no. i have oh, no idea really? when i'm finally uh, going to find out what actually gets replaced with insurance money or whatnot but i guess that'll be the big reveal at the end of this project and it seems like my optimistic uh projection of six weeks from three weeks ago according to the schedule that was given to me by the uh company um the restoration company that that is looks like to be spot on i'm supposed to be oh. let, let's put this out in the universe and see what happens supposed yeah. to be moving back into my apartment on november the 18th 
That's, 18th. Uh, that's the that's the date. That's I, hey, I think you're getting in there this month for sure. <laughs> this month. Remember, I'm, I, I am so. optimistic things are going to go better now for all of us. So way things back when, better. when I think it was Grinder saying that, oh, maybe you'll be back in time for Canadian Thanksgiving. I was like, no, no, no. Maybe by Remembrance Day. No, we're going to blow past that. That's for sure. Uh-huh. Now, now, as I think I said once before, maybe American Thanksgiving. Maybe by okay. we'll be back okay. in my apartment. So that's cook how a that's, turkey when you get in there. That's right. That's how that's going there. So uh, let's see. Did we talk about what we watched before we get into who the heck we are and all that stuff? You know what? I've already got it up on the screen. So I'll just say this Go is ahead. AV Rant. It's the show that answers your home theater and AV questions. And to get your questions answered, all you have to do is ask by sending us an email to question at avrant.com. That's our email address. That is by far the best way to reach us and have your questions answered on the podcast. Question at avrant.com. Of course, our website is avrant.com. We have the show notes there, all the previous episodes. If you want to dig back into the archives and listen to them, we got those Flickr albums in the show notes for each show in case you want to see the images and follow along. And then, yeah, there are other ways to reach us, uh, almost which are horrible social media things that I don't want to be a part of anymore, but regardless, we'll say that they're out there. <laughs> the one I'm still fine with for the most part, youtube.com slash avrant. Pretty darn useful. Glad we have a YouTube channel. Uh, but yeah, we're uh-huh. on Facebook as well, facebook.com slash avrantpodcast. And uh, you can reach us all individually. I am rob at avrant.com. If you want to just email me, tom at avrant.com is the email address just for Tom. And then all of us are on a thing called Twitter. We'll see how long that lasts. Uh, I am at first reflect. Tom is at avrant underscore Tom. And Lee Overstreet is, uh, what are you on I, Twitter over there? I am at Lee Overtweet. And uh, mm-hmm. not so ironically, at Tesla Lusa. <laughs> yeah. It's I don't his, know how I feel about it. Out in his okay. driveway listening to us recording right now, making we don't say anything bad about Papa Elon. So, yeah, yeah my car is listening. That's <laughs> what I expect. Probably. <laughs> right. we're, we're not going to dwell on that whatsoever because I have no interest in taking up our time with all of that nonsense. No. So instead, we'll talk about uh, some fun stuff. Let's talk about what we watched uh, okay. just briefly. So, uh, Lee, did you did you watch it? It doesn't have to be just from this last week. We haven't talked to you in a while. So anything interesting that you just wanted to mention? Let me tell you, that here's where I need some like advice from <laughs> some listeners. Because uh, between the various stressful things that have occurred recently and just being kind of ever more ruined by social media Mm. i'm now down to like tiktok videos okay like i i have lost my ability to watch a movie (laughs) right like and so i need some help here because i'm watching like 30 minute sitcoms maybe hour-long tv shows here and there with breaks like i you know i get 10 minutes in and i gotta do something else so i i need some help here Uh, my favorite (laughs) genre of course is space sci-fi okay okay and so one thing i did years ago was I got online and just searched like what have I missed what were Mm -hmm. the good sci-fi movies from this year this year this year and I looked at the past 10 years and I found a few and watched them and that was fun Uh, I haven't done that in years and so what's something I can watch from recent times okay just a good old-fashioned movie Ah. I don't I don't like I don't like comic book based movies. I'm sorry. I know Mm -hmm. that's the most popular thing, but I like space sci-fi. So if anyone has some recommendations to me, movies, not like TV shows, don't tell me the expanse. I know, I know it's there, but I mean, I was going to say the Orville if you haven't watched it. I have watched Orville, but I'm not looking for more TV. I actually want to reacquaint myself with movies. Heaven forbid, got a good system to watch them on. So, uh, you know, especially something that looks and sounds good, but uh, I like weird space sci-fi. So somebody help me out here. Okay. I, you can I need tweet some him, at Lee Overtweet. At Lee Overtweet. You can tweet there. me. Yeah. <laughs> and maybe one day, uh, you know, next year I hit 10 years of filling in on this show. Yeah. Maybe I get an AV rant email address. Wouldn't count on that. But uh, anyway, yeah, no, I, I'm still trying to convince you to watch Arcane, but if you've been saying you've been feeling stressed out, I'm not sure that's the best recommendation anymore. Okay, all right. Yeah. Well, I don't mind if a movie is stressful. I, okay. My brain can separate. This them. is only nine episodes, like three movies, you know, but yeah. anyway, I, I'm still disappointed I haven't had more people reach out and talk to about Arcane with me, but, you know, they didn't talk about she-ra with me either, so I just oh, I'm sorry. Live oh, that's right. I watched a few of the she <laughs> I need to do that again. I should, but first I want to do movies. I want to do movies. Those will put you in a better mood. Okay. All right. So uh, I ventured out to the theaters and watched Black Adam. That's what Ah. I did this past week. It's uh, my first time going back to the actual movie theater in ages. I think the last time was uh, Black Widow. So I I guess apparently just put black in the title and that's the thing that's going to get me to go. I guess I'll go see Black Panther as well. That's that's probably going to happen. There you go. There we go. We found the secret to getting me to go to the movie theater. Uh, (laughs) So yeah, Black Adam, uh, not as 
good as I hoped, not as bad as the online reviews said it was going to be, not in my opinion anyway. I like... Mm. You know, DC is doing their thing where they want their heroes to be gods and be godlike. That's mm. the way DC is approaching things in comparison to Marvel, which is more like, oh, they're human. They're, they're even Thor has like all his human foibles and okay. we make them more human and relatable over in Marvel. And in DC, they are above us. They are these godly figures above us. And that's what they did with Black Adam. I don't have a problem with that. That's the approach that they're mm. taking. Um, had a lot of good actors in this movie. The the story wasn't terrible. Uh, it, the story was fine. It's just the um, the structure of all things that I'm going to criticize the most with Black Adam. I think the structure was the biggest problem. I think they put things in the wrong order, which is a criticism I had of Zack hmm. Snyder's Justice League as well. I I I didn't hate Justice League. I certainly didn't love Justice League as a, as a lot uh, as much as a whole bunch of people did. But I thought that they put things in the wrong order i thought the structure like, not as not as as good as it could have been storytelling wise right how about that so yeah uh a lot of things that were kind of unexpected in black i knew nothing about this movie going in i i came in very very spoiler free so i didn't know what uh like who he was going to be going against he's going to be going against somebody um you know mm -hmm. i know very little about black adam from the comic books uh knew that he was basically a villain that shazam fought most of the time back when shazam was uh captain marvel in the dc universe until marvel took that name back um but that that was about all i knew about him so you know some of the reveals that happened in the movie i was like oh that's kind of cool i would have known that had i been a black adam comic book fan or even a shazam comic book fan but it seemed a little bit surprising to me so yeah i, I just felt that the order in which they decided to introduce all the characters of this movie didn't work it, it had the effect on me of oh we're just being taken over here now and pay attention to these people and now we're gonna whip you back to where we were and it's like they didn't have any thematic mm. through line that you know naturally transitioned from viewing this character into this character everybody kind of got their own individual starts to this movie at different times and it's like mm. you didn't seem to think about what scene ties into the next whatsoever in the that always feels when i see that in a movie i always think they're trying to put too much in this movie well, there was definitely a bit of that. It was certainly a bit overstuffed. There were probably too many characters that they were attempting to introduce in here. You know, unless you're a comic book fan and already know the backstory of everybody who's in this thing, um, you're, you're going to be left a little bit bewildered by some of it. And certainly some of the power sets that we saw from people, it's like, oh, well... You didn't make that nearly as interesting as their comic book version because you just didn't have time because it wasn't their movie. It's Black right. Adam's movie. So there's right, a bunch right. of that going on. Um, I felt like The Rock's natural charisma, Dwayne Johnson's natural charisma, which he very clearly has in many other movies and anytime you see him in live performances, uh, totally wasted. Um, the the huh. biggest criticism I have outside of the structure of Black Adam was that they just tried to be too cool for school. Uh, okay. Everything that was supposed to be humorous was delivered completely monotone, throw it away. We're not going to emphasize anybody's character. They tried to have a bunch of humorous things that in the script could have been humorous. None of it landed for me because everybody just delivered every line with zero emotion and no expression on their face because they were just trying to be cool. They're like, huh. we're not trying to be funny. Even though the script is like, this is a joke. Here's the setup. Here comes the punchline nothing just raspberries so i see what you mean yeah um, trying to be super duper intense yeah too was, cool huh yeah no, they're just I trying to be too cool we're, they're, we're so cool we can't have a laugh so anyway uh thumbs slightly downward on black adam for me i wouldn't go uh spending a whole bunch of money to race on get that however lots of good bass lots of good bass and rumbles <laughs> going on particularly the beginning if you just kind of want to pop your head into a theater and experience the opening of the movie uh <laughs> then there you kind of got your your zeros dollars worth if you can sneak in there i will say i like the musical theme for black adam himself so we've got another good superhero theme in the dc universe okay gotcha. enough about all of that uh let's crack on and thank our listeners of the week listeners of the week or people who have supported the podcast in some way one way you can do that is by going to our website avrant.com on the desktop version over on the right hand side there is a cup of coffee that says support av rant so if you click on that it will take you to paypal where you can make a one-time donation any amount you please and i uh, happen to know normally only tom sees those things but i happen to know joseph made a paypal donation this week so thank you very much to joseph for the financial yeah, thank support you. 
Uh, we also have other financial supporters who do so on an ongoing and regular basis via Patreon. So patreon.com slash podcast is the place to go to make an automatic monthly donation. You choose the amount. A dollar is the minimum per month. So we have 139 patrons doing that over there. And we have one of our listeners, Bastion, who has been a longtime patron. Let us know via email. So thank you to our 139 patrons and Bastion. And as we always say, you can add zeros after that one as many as you like. Please feel free to fall asleep on the keyboard and then wake <laughs> up and click, yes, I agree. That's exactly how much I decided to give Davey Rant every month. <laughs> okay. Uh, there, And then there are notes of gratitude, right? There sure are people who have thanked us for keeping the podcast going, which we very much appreciate. So we've got uh, Aris, Eric, Nick, Wayne, Brannon, uh, Bastion, who... Like I said, he's a longtime listener. He also says he's a member of the Two Hour Plus Club, but somehow he doesn't know the secret words. So mm. I don't know. Are you? Maybe he stops at exactly two hours, and that was one of those weeks <laughs> we went over. Uh, in any case, he says he's not really a big fan of our uh, What We Watched segment that we just completed. He'd be happier if it went shorter. <laughs> so I don't know. I don't think I prattle on all that long about the stuff that I watch. So, you know, take it up with Tom. Tom, and Tom has stuff. gotten pretty intense about what he has watched. And hey, today I flipped it, and I'm asking for space sci-fi that's advice. right that'll work tell me what to watch not what i tell watch. <laughs> so uh also got a couple more names on uh the notes of gratitude here greg h he says he finds us to be a voice of reason in the home theater world he's getting a bit annoyed by the influencer culture and the echo chamber yeah. of uh sponsored comment and commenters in the comment section who all seem to buy into the fear of missing out mentality so he thanks us just for being us thank you greg. how about I appreciate that? that and uh we also have chris on this list so yeah that's all the folks who thanked us for keeping the podcast going through as i'm just referring to it now the times and uh <laughs> <laughs> is optimistic that the times are coming to an end and it'll only be good times from here on out that's what i hope think for. things are going to turn around <laughs> i kind of do I, you well, know, if big, I've got my reasons you. for thinking that, it just, it's no, coming. that's the good way to be. So big, big thank you to everybody who continues to listen. Send in your questions, question at avrant.com. So uh, yeah, that's all our intro stuff. How far are we into this podcast? Not even We're, 20 minutes. We're doing just fine here. That's <laughs> fine. It's time for some news. It is. Uh, let's jump into that. Uh, Monoprice continues to expand its monolith speaker series. They began with their THX Ultra Certified Atmos Enabled Speakers including in-wall versions and later on-wall models as well. And their first THX certified compact satellites and 5.1 package with an 8-inch subwoofer were recently introduced. They expanded their monolith speaker offerings with the more affordable Encore series in 6.5-inch and 5.25-inch versions. And now they're introducing their most affordable entry level to the monolith speaker family yet, the monolith audition series with five and a quarter inch and four inch versions. The Monolith Audition T5, C5, and B5 are priced at $250 each, $160 each, and $125 each, respectively. In case you couldn't guess from the wonderfully short and logical model numbers, that's a tower, a center, and a bookshelf model, TC. Even Tom could get behind those ones, I'm pretty darn sure. That said, is the kind of straightforward, honest labeling of products right. that I appreciate. Uh, the smaller T4, C4, and B4 are priced at $200 each, $130, and $100 each, respectively. Yeah. Uh, they're all rear-ported designs using vinyl-wrapped MDF cabinets with five-way binding posts. Being monoprice monolith speakers, they're all 4-ohm rated with sensitivity ranging from about 84 decibels to 87 decibels at one meter. Although, with their 4-ohm sensitivity, that's with 2 watts rather than 1 watt. Basically, don't expect to hit full reference volume with these from more than about 10 feet away. That's, yeah, that's not terribly sensitive, but I guess that increases power handling. So. Hmm. They use 0.75-inch soft dome tweeters in a waveguide with either four inch or five and a quarter inch plastic woofers. Frequency response graphs look nice and flat, so hopefully these will be a good entry level option. I mean, it sounds like it. I, I always feel pretty good about Monoprice. Yeah, I mean, once again, level. these are not super small. They're not huge, uh, but these are definitely not what I would call, you know, compact little satellite speakers by any stretch. Darn right. good value in the towers. Like the bulk of that price is just going to those cabinets. It is not cheap to make cabinets that size, braced right. inside, ported design. Uh, one thing I am noticing, assuming that the sort of exploded views that they have on their website and I'm showing on YouTube right now, if those are accurate, they don't appear to have a separate back enclosure inside of the cabinet just for the tweeter. 
Mm -hmm. uh, they don't seem to have that. So it appears as though the back of the tweeter uh, in its waveguide is open to the uh, rest of the cabinet inside. But that might just be incomplete imaging that they're showing there. That's not necessarily. Right, However, right. at this price point, I wouldn't necessarily expect that they've uh, gone with, you know, uh, additional inside cabinetry that uh, isn't shown there so anyway looking at the uh, yeah the frequency response guys i'm just showing one example but they all look very very mm -hmm. similar yeah really really flat lines the four series the one with the four inch drivers those do uh start to roll off right at about 110 hertz which is pretty typical for uh, anything mm -hmm. with woofers of that size totally fine to cross those over at 100 or 110 hertz would be the likelihood uh, as terms mm -hmm. of your base management uh the ones with the five and a quarter inch drivers they do get right down to about 90 hertz that's where they start to roll off so again perfectly reasonable reasonable for these designs. There's one little odd kind of dip up around 13 and a half kilohertz that shows up in all of these. I'm thinking that's some kind of artifact coming from that waveguide that they've got mm -hmm. around the tweeters. Uh, that's sort of the only explanation I could think of because there's no way that the mid-range is crossing over way up that high. So no. it's kind of interesting to see that weird little dip. Like I say, it looks about 13 and a half kilohertz that all of them have that. But regardless, uh, throughout the mid-range and everything, these are measuring pretty close to ruler flat. So so I'm expecting pretty decent performance out of those. Wouldn't expect them to be world beaters in terms of sheer output. Um, being a four ohm load, yeah, if you're trying to like power nine of these off of a single AV receiver in a medium to large sized room, might be pushing things a little bit. These are meant right. for a medium to small sized room for sure. Like I say, that sort of 10 to 12 foot distance, 12 feet will be fine if you're not quite getting to full reference volume. So, you know, they're all in that range. All of this looks good. Not super duper tiny, but I'm uh, like I was mentioning before, I'm not keen on how much I'm seeing the price points go up on everything. So I'm happy whenever a solid company like Monoprice comes in and says, hey, we got a new entry level offering. It measures well. It's solid engineering. It's basic designs. And there's no reason to go nuts with this stuff and uh, charging very reasonable prices. 200 bucks for a pair of nice bookshelf speakers. Pretty darn good these days. That's a very good deal. I think they're shooting for that B plus A minus kind of situation, right? Yeah. Like, and that's good that somebody needs to do that. Um, moving on, uh, Epson has updated their ultra short throw projector lineup and introduced their $2,000 Epic Vision, spelled with a Q in the middle there, Epic right. Vision LS300 and $3,500 Epic Vision Ultra LS800. Compared to the previous periscope lens designs, these new models are much more living room friendly in appearance, and they've greatly reduced the necessary distance between the projector's lens and the screen, so it's easier to get the maximum 120 inch screen size offered by the LS300 or the new maximum 150 inch screen size offered by the LS800. Both models use native 1080p resolution LCD panels with a laser light source, 3600 lumens for the LS300 and 4000 lumens for the LS800. The LS300 sticks with HD resolution input, although it can accept up to 4K 30 signals with HDR10. LS800 uses Epson's 4K Pro UHD pixel shifting to show up to 4K60 with HDR, but unlike their LS11000 and LS12000 laser models, these only shift their native 1080p panels twice per frame, not four times per frame. So you'll be seeing half of 4K resolution actually on the screen, and it only has HDMI 2.0 ports, no HDMI 2.1, although one of the ports can accept 1080p 120 which can be shown natively thanks to that two times pixel shifting. Mm -hmm. uh, low input lag under 20 milliseconds is touted for gaming. So you've got the high frame rate and low uh, number there. AV rant listener Greg H wrote in to say that he upgraded from the Epson LS500 that he bought last year and regretted to the new <laughs> LS800. And he's very happy that he did black levels, brightness and colors have all been substantially improved. And he feels the LS800 now competes well against regular projectors around the same price point. But with the added benefits of being able to contend with a lit room when used with an ultra short throw ambient light rejecting screen, of course, and the convenience of placing the projector at the front of the room directly below the screen. So, there you go. Already a positive review. 
Yeah, uh, I certainly think the price points are reasonable for what they're offering here. Uh, this is becoming a very competitive uh, segment of the market. These ultra short throw projectors, most of them using laser light engines. This is the uh, dual blue lasers. We have a single blue laser for the blue channel and then a blue laser that excites a yellow phosphor to create the green and red channels that are going in there. Three chip design. So yeah, I mean, uh, Epson has stuck with native 1080p panels. Uh, they haven't gone to any uh, native 4K resolution panels just yet. I'm a little bit disappointed that, you know, their their uh, upper tier $3,500 LS800 isn't at least doing 4K60 by this point. You know, they've got the yeah. four times per frame uh, pixel shifting in that LS11000, but that is a more expensive projector, so uh, I guess there's, there's some going on there. You can take a 4K signal in that LS800, just uh, can't entirely show it. One other quirk that was uh, shown in the spec sheet for both of these models is that that uh, the maximum color gamut is Rec. 709. Uh, they're not doing the full DCI P3 wide color gamut on either of these models, so that's just a limitation of um, the uh, the wavelength of blue laser that they're using, along with that yellow phosphor, mm -hmm. just containing it to the Rec. 709, but staying very accurate within Rec. 709 apparently. So yeah, these are one where uh, it's kind of difficult to say that this is like drastically beating out anybody else's offerings at this price point. The one thing where Epson still has a slight advantage over pretty much all the other ultra short throws are DLP, uh, is just in that native contrast and the black level. Uh, according to you know the early reviews on the LS800 in particular, uh, yeah, just like Greg uh, mentioned. Was that Greg? Does that get that name Greg right? Greg H. Yep, Greg mm -hmm. H. Uh, just like he mentioned, yeah, the, the black levels are substantially improved on that LS800, apparently. So that's sort of the thing. Contrast is king as far as image quality goes on these types of things. Um, so yeah, it was kind of funny seeing some of the demos where they had this set up at uh, Cedia, and they're just talking about, oh yeah, these new ambient light rejecting screens and the black levels, and they've got people showing it on video. I'm like, yeah, yeah, those black bars are still very gray, uh, you know, but but it looks yeah. better. It's watchable. You know, it's not completely washed out to white like it would be on a normal screen. I will grant oh, you yeah, yeah, now yeah. the black bars are a dark gray, which is a huge improvement over completely washed out white. Uh, but yeah, we're definitely still not at uh, anything close to flat panel levels with these with the lights on. Nevertheless, you can't get a 150 inch flat panel for $3,500, can you? So that's no. where that's where. What is in. the typical price right now if you want to hit true 4K, native 4K 60? Uh, with a projector? projector? Yeah. Uh, yeah, you are getting to that five thousand dollar price point okay. uh, with, and that's Epson. That that's Epson's own LS eleven thousand, LS right. twelve thousand. Uh, those are coming in um, at the lower price point. Sony, you're going to be at six thousand dollars. JVC, you're going to be at seven thousand dollars. So right. um, there are the DLP projectors, of course, that do a similar, you know, four times pixel shifting thing with a 1080p mm -hmm. panel. Uh, but if you're saying what you know, native panel that just has yeah, right. the actual 4K pixels, no pixel shifting, then yeah, you're you're looking at about five thousand dollars and up still. All right, there you go. Uh, some comments coming in. Wayne, regarding Tom's comments last week about streaming Thursday Night Football on Amazon Prime Video, Wayne was watching last week using the built-in Amazon Video app on his Samsung TV, and other than a few glitches near the beginning, it looked good. I agree. But then he went into a different room for a bit and was streaming the same game using his Roku Ultra on his Sony TV. It looked horrible, just like Tom described with tons of digital artifacts, unwatchable. As an experiment, he switched to using the Sony TV's built-in app, and now it looks smooth and clear, just like his Samsung in the other room. So in his case, streaming it via his Roku Ultra was the issue, which clearly shouldn't have any problem from a hardware perspective. So it must be something to do with the streams being sent. Maybe they're prioritizing built-in TV apps for some reason. And I can verify that on the LG OLED, mm -hmm. it looks spectacular. It's mm. like literally the best sports stream ah, okay. I've seen. Other because I have yet to watch like a 4K HDR sports stream. Right. I haven't seen that yet. So short of 4K HDR, it's the best I've seen on my LG. I just love it. I watch it even if I don't care who the teams are, just because it looks great. Yeah, uh, I mean, I know Tom for sure wasn't using anything built into his display because he uses a projector that doesn't right. have any streaming apps built into itself. I don't know if he was using his xbox series x or he has i think it is a roku i think he's got a roku device i that forget what his other, right. his other streaming device yeah. is that seems to ring a bell in my head that it was a roku so i i don't know um 
uh, exactly what's going on there. I mean, there are, I know there are the instances where, because there are so many different app platforms to support um, that certain services do prioritize, you know, get get the, the best quality and the, and the fastest updates out to these platforms first, and the other ones will follow on whenever we get around to them, if ever. So um, it would seem weird to not prioritize Roku. However, this is Amazon Prime Video. So if there's yeah. any streaming box uh, that, you know, streaming That's stick right. that they support, I'm sure it would be the Amazon Fire TV device. I guarantee first. you it looks great on the Fire Stick. Okay. I haven't seen it, but I guarantee you it does. So, yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe this is a bad. Maybe it's even intentional of being like, don't watch it on a competitor's stick. You know, I yeah. believe that 100%. <laughs> I think that's that, exactly what that's it is. That's a bit of speculation. But, yeah, given that you had this commonality between Tom and yourself when using a Roku device, uh, yeah, the notion that, you know, they're just detecting, hey, because they, they definitely can detect and track what device are you watching this on. Sure. Uh, sure. If they just haven't bothered to update the Roku version of the Amazon Prime Video app to support streaming this way that they're doing with live programming, that that might just be it. So let's hope that it's just a matter of they haven't gotten around to it yet, as opposed to it being anything intentional. Uh, but could be. Yeah. If you've got another right. device, give it a try. I don't know. Maybe if Tom had switched to his Xbox Series X, it would have worked better. I just, I hate to be so cynical, but if it's a separate device outside of a TV, I <laughs> bet you they're prioritizing that fire stick. Uh, Yannick's comment, wanted to give a shout out to simplehomecinema.com and specifically their detailed pro guides for video and audio calibration, as well as room treatment. Most of the guides cost about $10 each. Yannick found them very useful as he has been into home theater for years, visited forums and listened to podcasts. Uh, while the information found in these guides is out there, Yannick found it worthwhile to have it clearly written out almost step by step, which helped it all click for him. So he's a big fan and just wanted to share that. Yeah, the uh, the email that he sent almost seemed like a bit of a copy for an advertisement, but he assured us that uh, he has absolutely <laughs> no affiliation with them, just a happy customer. I have no problem uh, mentioning simplehomecinema.com. Go check out their website. They've got a bunch of articles up there that are free to read, uh, sort of like yeah. introductions and all that type mm -hmm. of thing. So if you like what's written over there, you want to consider uh, you know, paying five, 10, 15 bucks. They, there's a few different guys that they've got there at a few different price points, but the average seems to be right around 10 bucks. So you got one person in Yannick who was a big, big fan, really helped him sort of just coalesce a lot of this information that he's, you know, pulled in from forums and yeah. podcasts and reading articles around, but he's just like never quite all gelled together into a cohesive, uh, now I know exactly what to do. And apparently these guides helped him do that. So happy that you found that, Yannick. Glad you feel like you got your money's worth and anybody else who wants to check it out, it is simplehomecinema.com. Hey, well-curated information like that is a good thing. Sure. I understand completely. So how about some questions, Rob? Why don't we? This is supposed to be a question and answer podcast. That's what we say it is. <laughs> That's right. Well, we just have our short little intros before we get to the questions. That's all. Uh, so here we go. Uh, question from last week. Uh, Greg L. has some questions. Greg had that weird issue with his projector lamp where the original lamp was fine. Then he replaced just the bare bulb, and that was fine. But then he replaced the entire lamp housing, and the green part of the image would cut out after 20 minutes, making everything purple. Swapping back to the old lamp worked fine, but it's getting dim now. Mm -hmm. So he took our suggestions. First, he looked for any sort of bent pin or connector. Yeah, but it's all covered by plastic housing. He couldn't spot anything. And the plastic housing all around made it so he really couldn't bend anything anyway. So... He went to the trouble of swapping a brand new bulb out of its housing into the old housing. And while he was at it, he put the old dimming bulb into the new housing. Mm -hmm. The new bulb in the old housing had the green purple issue. But somehow the old bulb, the old bulb in the new housing worked fine. <laughs> so <laughs> maybe yeah. it's just that the new bright bulb gets hotter than the old dimming bulb. But other than that, he's out of ideas. Do we have any? Or is it just time to bite the bullet and send it off for repair at the minimum cost of several hundred dollars? This is interesting. <laughs> yeah, this one is bizarre. Uh, it is, of course, the opposite of what I hoped would happen. Because, I mean, if he had been able to just take the brand new bear ball, put it into the old housing, and that worked, well, okay. It's a hassle. It takes extra time. But yeah. at least it would have been usable. But the idea that I, I, I can't think of an explanation why the old bulb, and he went through two of them, right? He had the original, uh, yeah, yeah. he had a replacement bare bulb. Now he's going on to 
you know, lamp number three, but mm-hmm. I have no explanation why the second bulb, uh, just the bare bulb, into the new housing works just fine, suggesting that the issue isn't the physical connector or the housing, which to me seemed like by far the most likely potential culprit, yeah. but apparently the housing with the old bulb works okay, but the new bulb, even in the old housing, still has this issue. I I mean, what he suggested there, like the new bulbs getting hotter. I mean, that's about all I can think of. I can't think of an electrical. There's no circuit so, in the bare bulb. There's a circuit in clear, the housing. Just to be clear, the new bulb in the new housing doesn't work right? Correct. The new bulb okay, the, in the new housing also gives this issue. But new bulb in old housing worked? New bulb in old housing doesn't work. Doesn't work. The but only old thing that bulb works is the new old housing bulb. <laughs> yeah. Okay. The old so the bulb only... in the old housing, the old bulb in the new housing, that works okay. okay. But this is the second of two bulbs. So, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I, I have no other ideas. I don't know what it could be. Um, I, I, God, this doesn't seem like something that should need to be sent off for repair at the cost of several hundred dollars when right. it does work. Like, what are they yeah. going to do? It, it Like, they're initial ex, uh, explanation when he contacted JVC before, there is a ribbon cable that, that quite frequently comes loose when people replace the lamps in the projectors. Yeah, yeah, like, it yeah. could just be a loose ribbon cable. It would cost money to send it in. They're going to charge like $200 just to look at the thing. But if it's just a loose ribbon cable, it won't cost him, cost him much beyond that. But I'm like, how could it be that when it still works, even with a, you know, a new housing goes in there, just using the old bulb, I don't see how it could be a loose ribbon cable. So then they were like, well, there's a video circuit board in there that might need to be replaced. That's going to be like over a thousand dollars. And, but again, I'm like, how? I so don't, only, the new don't bulb know. doesn't work in any housing. That's what we're saying, right? Apparently. Yeah. Not with okay. his particular the, projection unit. But the old bulb in the new housing works. Yeah. Okay. Huh. <laughs> I, I <laughs> is this new bulb and new housing are they not built right are they non-standard well i mean if the housing weren't built right then you couldn't just put the old bulb in there and have it work fine right. so maybe the new bulb is the problem it's well, not it would seem to be but i mean by what mechanism that's what that, that doesn't know. make sense to me I, by what mechanism yeah. could that be the case so uh, i mean we uh I'm trying to rack my brain while well, I've been thinking about this, you know, for the the past week since this question came in. I can't come up with a good explanation that makes sense to me. I can only suggest continuing to talk to JVC and trying to exhaust everything with their technicians that you can before sending it in because it seems yeah. unlikely to me that they're going to open up your projector, perhaps even replace the video circuit board and find a solution to this. I I can't figure out by what me- what mechanism a new hmm. bulb even in the old housing would cause this issue. It's it's kind of bizarre to me. I mean, like Tom and I mentioned a few weeks ago when this question first came in, there are such things as running order changes, you know, in parts that are being manufactured, but perhaps the bulbs themselves really are being manufactured in some different way. But why that would yeah. result in this, I, I can't think of what mechanism. It's, maybe it's that. drawing a little more power or not enough or some signal. It's it's confusing the projector somehow. It's a bizarre I, one. So, yeah. I mean, I really wish I could give you a solution if anybody out there has any better ideas than what we've just said. The only thing I can suggest trying to you um there is what they just colloquially refer to as bulb conditioning if you are not setting your lamp mode too high and leaving it there for about the first 200 hours um you want to leave the lamp on full blast when it's brand new for about the first 200 hours to, mm. as they refer to it, condition the lamp. Um, there's these sort of little cathodes inside that have a little arc that needs to jump across, and that can become sort of like dulled uh, if you've got the lamp, uh, the power mode set to low. That usually doesn't happen for like, you know, several hundred th- or a couple thousand hours in, but when you first get it, it is recommended that you just, you know, blast that thing on high for about the first 200 hours. So, I mean, that's still cheaper than sending it yeah. in for a multi-thousand dollar I mean, repair. it's like you need the projector to get used to the new bulb. I don't know. <laughs> I, I, again, I would talk to their technicians, again, exhaust as much of it as you can. But I'm really sorry I don't have a better answer than that. Again, if anybody out there has a better idea than what I've just mentioned, please let us know. It just defies logic. Mm. <laughs> he has more questions. Um, 
he still has his Polk RTI speakers up front. He's wanted to upgrade them for some time now, and he was leaning towards the uh, Shoe CCB8 coaxial speakers. That is pronounced shoe, right? Yeah, it is. Yeah. I mean, they've said that the name has like a different inflection, but they're just like, just say shoe. Shoe works. Everybody can pronounce it. We'll go yeah. with shoe. It is spelled H-S-U in case you are Googling it. So yeah, right. that's the company. Shoe. But he came across someone selling a single Kef LS50 Meta speaker for only $400. So he snapped it up. <laughs> he wants to do a direct A-B comparison to his Polk front speaker. So he was thinking... Here's all the things he was thinking. He'd connect the single LS50 Meta to the front left speaker wire. He'd connect a single Polk speaker to the front right speaker wire. He'd stack one speaker on top of the other, so they're essentially co-located. He'd set up his AV receiver as a 2.1 setup. He'd keep his subwoofers active and run Odyssey. He'd just unplug one speaker or the other to AB compare them. <laughs> Whew, okay. That, I don't know how scientific it sounds, but I get it. I get what he's shooting for. Yep. He wants to know how the LS50 meta will compare to his Polk speakers in the way that he'll actually use them. So he doesn't want to just run them both full range with no Odyssey. If he hears a difference that way, he figures it won't be the same difference once his subs, base management, and Odyssey all get involved. So is his proposed method a better way to get a real world idea of the difference? What would we suggest? You know, for me, <laughs> I have sort of two modes of doing things when it comes to technical stuff. Mm -hmm. Either I've got to go full in scientific with a million notes measuring things or just hook the new speakers up correctly as they are going to be used. Listen and see if you like them. <laughs> That's my two methods. So I don't like what he's doing here is I, I see what he's getting at. But ouch. yeah. I, I have a feeling he's maybe a person who overthinks things sometimes. Uh, but I however, can feel it. Yes. I, I don't. I don't think what he's proposed is unreasonable because I mean I no. get where he's coming from, right? Because uh, honestly, normally the way I would suggest, and I, I will still suggest this. What method do we suggest? I do suggest because I don't like the idea of physically unplugging the speaker wires. At some point, yeah. you're going to forget to turn the AV receiver off in between, and it puts in a delay that makes that sort of instantaneous AB comparison all but impossible. Right. So, what I what I would propose normally is you have an AV receiver that allows you to set things up as speaker A and speaker B. Uh, I would go ahead and do that. I would, I, I do recommend set a crossover, uh, set those speakers to small and set a crossover. Don't run the full range because it is far too easy to get swayed by bass. Uh, mm -hmm. We tend to just, you know, gravitate towards whatever speaker outputs more bass, even if it isn't accurate. And right. then if you're hearing a bunch of bass coming from a speaker, it masks a bunch of detail in the upper mid range and treble. So That's right. uh, some of that, you know, detail that you're trying to perhaps switch speakers for, you're not going to be able to notice. And I mean, even if you are aware that this is going on, it's one of those illusions that our brain cannot like concentrate its way through we're just subject to this stuff gets masked yes. by bass we just gravitate towards deeper bass and louder bass so definitely do set them to small set a crossover set a crossover that's higher than 80 hertz is my methodology i'll often start with my speakers crossed over at 200 hertz so that oh. i'm filtering out a lot of you know, the bass <laughs> so that I right. can really just hear predominantly the mid range and treble coming this from the speakers, but I'll hook them up as speaker A and speaker B so that I can do a very fast electronic switch just via the remote control between mm. speaker A and speaker B. Now speaker B will not have Odyssey applied to it. So That's I right. wouldn't be applying Odyssey to speakers A either. You know, right, I'd just right. be running them in stereo listening mode, having that crossover set, not having the subwoofer active, so that I can just hear the difference of the native sound between the mid-range and treble. Now, I still recommend that even with his concerns, because even though Odyssey does do full range correction, largely the upper mid-range and treble doesn't get touched very much in speakers, because as you move that microphone around from position to position, uh, you know, you'll see in any of the graphs where you take multiple microphone measurements across different locations, you get pretty different graphs from C very yeah mm -hmm. uh when it comes to the treble so there isn't a ton that odyssey can really do when it's doing its spatial averaging because very often you know what's up in one seat will be down in another so it can't really eq that effectively across all seats and more or less leaves it alone so i still recommend the speaker a speaker b methodology then 
what you've proposed, I don't have any problem with. Exactly as you said, one of them's connected to the left speaker, one of them's connected to the right. You do run Odyssey, you set it as 2.1. It's in situ even stacking them or just placing them side by side so that their location in the room is pretty darn close to co-located. I just would recommend modifying that a little bit by not doing the physically unplugging one speaker or the other and plugging the speaker wires back in. I would use your phone as the source device you know, oh. you can either do that via Bluetooth or plugging it in with your uh, USB cable and then using your phone setting with the uh, left to right slider, you know, that can put all the sound into just the left channel coming out of the phone or putting oh. all the sound into just the right channel coming out of the phone. Uh, or if you have another source device, a, uh, you know, a CD player or something that lets you do that, that left right channel balance where you can throw all the sound into one channel or the other. Yeah. I would do it that way rather than physically unplugging things. Right, because old school receivers had the balance knob on the front. Yeah. You could just turn, turn. That's and right. nowadays you don't have that anymore. Nope. I'm, I'm sitting next to one that has that. But right you can now. do it in your source device. That's right. Oh, and boy, I can tell you when the bass is inaccurate and heavy, yeah. it does mask the other qualities of your speaker. I, I remember when I got these two SVS subwoofers, one effect I noticed was it was as though it made my treble and mid-range clearer. Right, yeah. Like suddenly vocals got better and <laughs> other sounds got clearer in my perception. I'm yeah. sure the, the drivers were making the right sounds, but it just seemed so much better. Um, if he ends up loving the Kef LS50 Meta, should he grab a pair of non-Meta Kef LS50s to use as front, left, and right while his single LS50 Meta serves as the center? Wait for a deal on another LS50 Meta to make a pair and run a Phantom Center. Wait for a sale on a pair of LS50 Metas to have a perfectly matching front three and blow his budget. <laughs> Just use the single LS50 Meta as a center and not worry too much or rush things. I like the last option for mm. now. <laughs> but uh, my instinct is get, get the same, at least brand, using the same kind of Yeah, like I'm not... I'm not crazy about using an LS50 meta between a pair of Polk RTI front left and right speakers. I mean, if you are not critical about timbre match across the front whatsoever, you'll be fine. But if you're closer to me where I demand a pretty darn good timbre match across my front three speakers, that's yeah. going to sound uneven when stuff pans mm -hmm. across the front. That LS50 meta is significantly different from your Polk RTI mm -hmm. speakers, in my opinion, anyway. So yeah, I can't totally get on board with that one. My inclination... What I would recommend most people do is find another LS50 meta and have a pair and run a Phantom Center because that, that's going to work really, really nicely. If uh, you sit in the middle, I'm not a fan of Phantom yeah, Center because yeah. I like to flop over on the side of the couch ah, and over here go. now and it isn't coming from the middle. I So I don't like that, but I now, see how you using can like an LS50 meta as the center while the original LS50s, the non-meta version that preceded the LS50 meta, using a pair of those at the front left and right, I have no problem with that. Uh, yeah. there's... Are those the same tweeter or very similar? It's the same tweeter. They just changed some of the internals. They changed a bit of the woofer. They changed some of the crossover. There were changes okay. made. Um, yeah. the, the meta right. has this meta material in the back to catch the back wave that wasn't uh, in the originals. Okay. Um, but I, I like close. the sound signature between the LS50 and the LS50 meta is not drastically different. So that to me is probably where I think you're going to land. Um, yeah. yeah, but there you go. That, that's my top three. Uh, what I wouldn't do, I don't think it's necessary to blow your budget and only get a pair of LS50 metas to pair up with a single as LS50 meta that you already mm -hmm. have. If that's blowing your budget, I don't recommend that because I think pairing up with the regular LS50s from a few years ago will be perfectly fine. Yeah, I like the non-meta left-right solution on, on <laughs> Uh, Tony. Tony wants a 65 inch TV for his living room. Excellent. It's fairly bright, although he does have curtains to control the amount of light in there if needed. He's got a max budget of 2000 Canadian dollars. He'll be using the TV for gaming, watching sports and streaming shows using the TV's built in apps. He's got a dedicated home theater with a projection set up for serious movie watching so mm -hmm. he's separating this as being not for serious movie watching <laughs> okay so what do we suggest the lg c1 is down to 1900 for that size as is the sony a80j both being models from 2021 but should he consider a much brighter lcd such as the hisense u8h 
I mean, I can tell you having a LG OLED, it's pretty bright. And yeah. I have a living room yeah. where I, for the window behind our couch, big window behind our couch, it's got uh, bamboo blinds mm-hmm. with kind of thin curtains in front of that. And it's fine. These it's, concerns it's that people have over LCDs are brighter than OLEDs, so yeah. you can only use LCDs in well-lit rooms. Like it just it doesn't bear out in reality for me. I no. will grant you, if you have direct sunlight out on a veranda hitting your television, right, right. then some of those Samsung LCDs or some of these like Hisense now that can get insanely bright are about the only way to get a watchable image. But I will tell you this, nothing keeps black actually looking black like an OLED. And specifically, yeah, like an yeah. LG display W OLED, because even the new QD OLEDs that Samsung has introduced and Sony has used in some of their models, the black on that, when light hits it, turns a bit dark gray. It's not mm-hmm. terrible, but it doesn't stay inky, inky black like the LG display OLEDs do. So I'm going to say, as declaratively as I get, as far as telling people what I think they should buy, I think you should get an LG C1 OLED. It's down to a very reasonable price. You mentioned yes. gaming. The LG C1 OLED is superior in terms of gaming support over the Sony OLEDs right now. So mm-hmm. to me, it's the LG C1 all day long. I don't think you could get any happier than that display is going to make you. Oh, I-, I couldn't agree more. I can tell you, like... Uh... Uh, if, if someone is sitting on the couch watching our LG 65 inch OLED and you're in the next room and you look through the doorway mm. and you see that it looks like a car is shining headlights on that person. Right. So <laughs> the TV is bright enough. Yes. I mean, unless you have a greenhouse for a living room, uh, it, it should be just People fine. are so worried that all they watch is the entire screen in peak white. And, you know, the LG OLED is down like under 150 nits at a full white screen, whereas the LCDs yeah. can be like four or 500 nits at a full white screen. And that's all we watch, Lee, yeah. is a full yeah. white that's screen. That's all, just all I ever watch. Yeah. Just close-ups of the sun. That's all I watch. No no yellow, no no round thing at all. Just the center <laughs> of the sun, entire that's screen right. white. That's all we watch. I just watched nuclear explosions on it. That's all I do. But yeah, and don't forget, you know, uh, nighttime is going to happen. There is and that it's thing. Going, it's going to be nighttime. Yeah. All right. Uh, Ilongo, I believe is how I pronounce mm-hmm. this name. First up, Ilongo really appreciated our discussion about his family room setup, and he's going to take it to heart. Rather than trying to make an all-in-wall 5.2.4 or 5.4.4 <laughs> configuration work in this open concept space where aesthetics come first, He's now just going to install 2.1 setup <laughs> using the shoe in-wall speakers we suggested and an SVS 3000 micro and save the rest of the money to put towards the fully dedicated home theater in the basement. Amen. Yeah. Because, you know, the fully dedicated home theater is where you blow it out. Like, this is definitely what Tom wanted Alongo to do. And yeah. he's, he's fully on board. I'm, you know, I'm such a surround sound head that I'm like, you yeah. know, I was, see, I was seeing my ways. I was finding all the ways that you could put in like a 5.2 system in here, um, yeah. you know, but I am I am back in this plan, too, because when you are going to have a dedicated theater in the basement, not right away, but it's coming up in the future, having right. that extra money on hand, because believe me, you're going to run into more things you want to do on the soundproofing side, more things yeah. you want to do on the acoustic treatment side, having that little bit of extra headroom in your budget is only going to be a positive thing and that's where you can really go whole hog on the audio system and really really enjoy what you got there so for watching tv in an open concept living room those hsu in wall horn loaded speakers love them for that and a svs 3000 micro if that keeps the rest of the family members happy as far as the aesthetics go can't beat that so Hugely yeah, on. I mean, you you have to live with the people you live with. You sure do. <laughs> and you have to take the space you live in as it comes <laughs> and deal with it. I understand. But yeah, only because a home theater is coming in the basement would I exactly. accept this yes. solution. Yeah. So now to his question. How exactly does the Apple TV 4K handle audio from Plex? He's got a Plex library already with Blu-ray and Ultra HD Blu-ray backups in MKV format. He kept the original audio, Dolby True HD, sometimes with Atmos, and DTS HD MA, sometimes with DTS X. Uh, Is it true that the Apple TV 4K won't pass through any of those lossless audio formats when using its Plex app? What happens to the audio? Does it come out as PCM? If so, what happens to the Atmos or DTS-X metadata? 
Shall we stop there and answer sure. those first? Yeah. So, I mean, the short answer is the Apple TV 4K in all situations decodes the audio to PCM inside of itself. Mm-hmm. Now, you then have some options as to how that audio comes out of the Apple TV 4K. You can say, send it out as Dolby Digital 5.1 all the time, send it out as DTS 5.1 all the time, or send it out as PCM audio. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the case of your streaming apps, they are able to use the Dolby Mat PCM format, the metadata. Uh, I always forget what the thing stands for. Metadata something <laughs> or other that ends up okay, good saying enough. Mat. But whatever, there's metadata attached to the PCM that allows it to have an Atmos format coming out of the Apple TV 4K for that. But it doesn't work for the Plex app. In the case of the Plex app, you're basically going to be limited to those Dolby Digital 5.1 or DTS 5.1 settings inside of the Apple TV 4K if you want surround sound whatsoever from the Apple TV 4K Plex app. Now, there is a different app that you can use that will allow the Apple TV 4K to output lossless audio in multi-channel PCM format. So that's going to be decoding Dolby True HD into 7.1 PCM or decoding, decoding DTS HD Master Audio into 7.1 PCM. Uh, mm-hmm. And that is the Infuse app. The Infuse app is able to connect and read from your Plex library, so you don't have to redo that or anything like that. Uh, okay. It's going to be the interface instead of the uh, official Plex app, and that will allow you to have lossless audio. But neither of them will send out lossless Atmos or lossless DTSX. The Infuse app can't do it. The uh, dedicated Plex app, the official Plex app for the Apple TV 4K can't do it. Uh, Neither of them support outputting the original lossless bitstream, which is what you would need to do to retain lossless Atmos or lossless DTSX from your physical disk backups. So essentially that metadata is lost and ignored. Mm. That's what happens to the Atmos or the DTSX metadata on top of the Dolby True HD or DTS HD Master Audio uh, bed layer that's uh, you know actually housing all of the audio content. So yeah, uh, in short... So there's no way to do it on the Apple there's TV There's no 4K. way to do it on the Apple TV mm. 4K right now. The brand new version of the Apple TV 4K that was just released, still the same situation. They haven't updated that at all. So Does any device do what he's wanting? Yes. The NVIDIA Shield that is the best standalone uh, Plex playback device. That will just output the original bitstream from the uh, official Plex app if you want it to, and the Xbox Series X and Xbox uh, Series S. Those uh, can output it as well from the official Plex app. So those would be the ones to use. Uh, but of course, that means another device if you don't already have right. one. Right. Well, those that answers his next question because he was hoping yeah. uh, an Apple TV 4K could meet all of his needs because it fits well into his home kit based smart home automation mm-hmm. system. But so you're saying he'll need an NVIDIA Shield to really do what he wants with all of the audio in his Plex library. Yeah, specifically movies. for Plex. Like if you're like me and you try to have the, you know, the very best version of every streaming app, you end up with a mm. whole bunch of different streaming devices. Oh, you know, yeah. That's, yep, yep, yep. If, you want, if you want the best Roku, sto- uh, Roku app experience, you've got to have some kind of Roku device. If you want the best uh, YouTube experience, you either use the built-in app to your television or you use a Chromecast, uh, you know, uh, with Google TV, that's going to be the best YouTube experience. So yeah, it's uh, it's a bit of a no one device truly does all the apps in the very best possible quality. Right. And so as you say, Infuse app can connect to the Plex library and yeah. play lossless 5.1 or 7.1, but lossless Atmos and DTS X are still lost yeah. with that. So that's it. It just, it, it you're on the bleeding edge. That's just <laughs> how it is. I mean, and, and sometimes it's going to be difficult. I'm kind of, sometimes I'm happy that we only have the 5.2 oh, because right. it, it really does simplify. It does simplify. keep things simpler. That is for yeah. sure. Okay. Let's actually do new questions. Hey, look at this. We're only about an hour in. We got to it. That's pretty good. Yeah, we actually got to the new questions. Uh, Aris has questions. Let's dig into Aris's stuff here. Aris has continued to work on his new home theater, including making his own enclosures to turn his KEF in-ceiling and in-wall speakers into on-ceiling and on-walls. He has now completed two of his ceiling speakers and hung them up using Z-Clips. The other two are almost done, and he'll tackle the on-walls for his surrounds after that. 
Uh, and do, why did he do that? I must have missed that uh, discussion yeah, so in the past. Yeah, so didn't want to put any holes into his ceiling or walls. So he mm. didn't want to just install the in-wall and in-ceiling speakers that he had on on hand, you know, into the drywall, cutting holes in there. Um, okay. Didn't want to, you know, like he already had those. He already owned the in wall and the in ceiling speakers, already liked them. Kef THX series, they're very nice speakers. So he's like, well, I'm pretty good at uh, at handiwork. I'm pretty good at building cabinets and that. So he made some right on wall cabinets, essentially. Yeah. Okay. Did a really nice job. Sounds good. Too. If that's what, yeah, I'm seeing pictures here and the mm -hmm. finish looks very nice. Uh, he's using Kef CI 200 RRTHX in ceiling speakers as the drivers. He made sealed boxes lined with acoustic foam and stuffed with polyfill with a gasket around the perimeter of the driver. He puts uh, strips of rubber behind the Z clips to try and make sure there's no rattling, but it's still a metal to metal connection when he hangs them on the ceiling since the Z clips fit very snugly together and putting any rubber in between them just gets in the way and buckles. Uh, he tried playing his DIY on ceiling speakers just on their own before hanging them on the ceiling to make sure they were functioning correctly. They sounded better than expected with a surprising amount of bass hey you made the enclosures correctly then mm -hmm. but when a friend came over to listen to his system they put on blade runner 2049 which i still need to watch there's me sort of a space side oh yeah and they both noticed something that sounded like distortion or maybe clipping during the intro he did have the volume of the entire system turned up louder than he normally has it 80 out of 92 on his Denon, whereas he'd typically listen at 75 at the loudest. He, that, that, isn't that weird? Like we used, volume used to be one to 10. Right. <laughs> like what is, yeah, what is this to 92? He's left it in the absolute scale. Being a Denon, pretty darn sure if you go into the uh, settings, the audio settings, you could change that scale to the relative scale. Uh, and after running Odyssey, you'd be able to tell how many decibels above or below reference volume you are at that point. Okay, yeah, that's not... kind of the new way I would think yeah i'm not you're, you're sure minus up until zero 80 is going to be pretty close i think usually there's about 16 decibels of headroom so you might have even gone slightly above what would be zero on the relative scale but i'm not absolutely sure i don't actually know exactly what model of denon he right. has on the top of my head right right uh he tried taking the speakers off the z clips but the distortion sound was still there so it wasn't just the z clips rattling and he was using an 80 hertz uh crossover setting mm -hmm. After his friend left, he tried out some scenes from Transformers, Edge of Tomorrow, and Star Wars Episode One, and didn't hear any distortion during any of those. But then he did hear some distortion during some dialogue in Band of Brothers. So is it possible the distortion is actually in the content itself? Do we know if that distortion clipping sound is simply part of Blade Runner 2049? I'm going to go watch that and tell him. <laughs> and it's supposed to be there? If he turned the volume way down to like 45, he didn't hear the distortion anymore. Kind of answers the question. Uh, any advice on how to confirm whether there's anything wrong with his speakers themselves? Uh, I, I feel like it, it's time to do more scientific stuff here and have uh, a, a base sweep. Sweeps so and test tones. Mm -hmm. Sweeps and test tones are definitely the way to answer this because, uh, yeah, my recollection of Blade Runner 2049 during that opening is it did have like a distortion clipping sound in the soundtrack to oh, give okay. you that effect of, oh, this is really mega loud. Um, I gotcha. You know, they'll do that. So some music has that in it, too, where they actually just mm. mix in. They purposely clip the sound in yeah. the recording itself to give you the effect of, oh, this is playing super mega loud because right. that's what would happen if we did play it super mega loud. Your speaker system would clip. So, uh, yeah, my recollection is that that was part of Blade Runner 2049. If uh, I think it was Transformers Extinction that he played, if that didn't cause it, I, I kind of doubt it's actually your speakers. But there's a couple of things. I mean... Absolutely what you need, bass sweeps and test tones. Uh, go mm -hmm. to audiocheck.net and you can generate all that stuff. If you have Room EQ Wizard, you can generate all of that inside of Room EQ Wizard and just play some sweeps on repeat. Uh, play specific test tones if you're noticing during the sweep that well, it kind of sounds like, yeah, there's a frequency in there. You know, just adjust the frequency. Room EQ Wizard is perfect for doing that uh, because you can do it really granularly until you find what's wrong. The fact that you put in a DIY gasket in these holes that you cut in your DIY cabinets, right. it's not impossible. It's not out of the question that 
you know, at a certain frequency, it just happens to resonate just right in that cabinet that it causes yeah, yeah. some little bit of air escape or a little bit of flutter or something with the gasket that you put around the driver. That is not out of the question, uh, but it would be the sweeps and the test tones to nail down whether that's really the case. Um, yeah, just trying to say, oh, play this movie. That's not a great way to test it because no. it's not going to have all the frequencies, whereas a, a sweep will. All right, time to throw some science at it. Another question, could running his speakers that loud be doing damage to them? I would think probably not. Yeah, I mean, it's highly unlikely. Um, it's, again, it's not out of the question, but I mean, these speakers can handle a lot. The speakers themselves, no. Where where there could be an issue is if you were actually trying to power nine speakers off of the DEN and AV receiver and cranking it slightly above reference volume, the mm -hmm. amplifiers in the DEN in itself, they might be starting to run out of juice. Now, the thing is, the way the DEN and amplifiers are engineered, they have soft clipping, they they you could say fail to reproduce the actual amount of wattage that's being requested by the signal, but they do so very like delicately. They 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 don't just pour a bunch of clipped sound into your speakers right. when they do clip. So what you're describing, it's unlikely that that was due to you know too much power going into the speaker. It's not going to be that direction. If anything, it's that the signal requested more power than the Denning could deliver. But even so, the chances of it sounding like what you described is very 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 low. Sure, sure. Uh, for his surrounds, he's starting with the KEF CI3160RLTHX. See, that does make you appreciate things like C4. Yeah, T4. the center with a four-inch <laughs> woofer. What do you know? Yeah. <laughs> Given their tall rectangular shape, the enclosure he made for them uh, are much larger than his ceiling speakers. He once again has them lined with acoustic foam and will stuff them with polyfill and use a gasket, but is that enough? Should he be doing anything else to make sure they sound okay? I mean, as long as those uh, enclosures are stiff. Yeah, braced, that, that not, is my question Not creating question their here. own resonance. Because I don't believe he put any bracing inside of them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So that's that's the only question mark in my mind. Now, if you used really quite thick uh, MDF uh, and, you know, say brace the corners at least when you assembled all of it, then you're probably fine. You're almost certainly fine. Uh, yeah. But it's not, again, out of the realm of possibility that a, you know, a central brace uh, going across there might have been, um, you know, well, would you even hear it? It's highly unlikely you're ever going to hear it. We're, we're talking about a slight <laughs> bit of cabinet resonance that maybe could be measured. You might have to bust out an accelerometer as opposed to actually being able to measure it through a microphone playing a frequency response outside mm. of an anechoic chamber. Um, mm. So, I mean, ultimately, I don't think you have anything to worry about. If you, like, handle it, like, I'm just talking, you pick it up and handle it with your hands, and you essentially can't feel any flex in that box. If it yeah. really just feels very solid, and I'm hoping that's what, what the case is, then I don't think you really have anything to worry about. I agree. Uh, as far as mounting them on the sidewalls, he was going to use French cleats. I don't know what that is. Uh, since they weigh about 45 pounds each, would we recommend some other wall mounting method much more highly? Than a French cleat. I've just, this is going to be me learning what a French cleat is. Yeah, I mean, a French cleat, I mean, it's very much like a Z clip, except that you usually just make it out of wood. And so you attach one side with a little lip going up to the wall, uh, and you attach the other side with a little lip going down on the speaker. And uh, okay. the two lips okay. join each other. <laughs> I didn't know that was called a French cleat. Yep, that's, that's it. I uh, just kind of call it a wedge. <laughs> yes, that's right. I think that's a perfectly reasonable way of attaching your speakers to the wall. Yeah. Uh, I would kind of recommend, since there is a little bit of depth that comes from doing that, that you either have two French cleats, one at the top, one at the bottom of mm. the cabinet, so that it's all evened out. At the very least, you're going to need some kind of like little rubber feet or something on the bottom, because right. uh, the French cleat does have some depth to it where it's going to be hanging at the top. Uh, so I would probably recommend you know measuring very carefully and having two French cleats, one at the top, one at the bottom of those rectangles angular cabinets but i like that right. attachment method uh, uh, one more rs question uh, some of his speaker wire runs will end up being about 40 feet long what gauge of speaker wire should he use is there a reliable guide online somewhere any decent thick wire <laughs> i mean really yes uh the the uh, electrical uh thing the the guidelines for where would the resistance start to perhaps have an effect way up at you know 20 kilohertz uh mm. would be um basically telling you that you want to use 14 gauge wire or right. 
a lower numerical number being a thicker wire. So a 12 yeah, gauge, yeah. 10 gauge going to be totally fine. You probably wouldn't want to go much thinner than 14 gauge, but honestly, 16 gauge wire would be completely fine uh, yeah. for these. You're, you're honestly never going to hear the difference. But electrically speaking, they're going to say that 14 gauge wire or thicker, meaning 12 mm -hmm. or 10 gauge is what you want to use. Uh, there's a place called avgadgets.com where Tom Andre, the host hey. of this podcast, is editor-in-chief, and they have a wild, uh, wire cable gauge guide with a handy little table for you to look at that was written by Clint DeBoer ages ago, who also wrote about it for Audioholic, so you can look it up there as well. And both of them will tell you 14 gauge wire or thick. <laughs> yeah, there you go. It's Don't overthink it. Just get good speaker wire. 40 feet is not, you know, three kilometers or anything. All right. And I wouldn't be doing a podcast if I didn't get to read an infinite Gary question. Correct. <laughs> Gary was listening to Lonely World by the Firebirds on his 2.1 channel hi-fi setup, a pair of Revel bookshelf speakers with an SVS cylinder sub. He was actually listening to it on YouTube using his Apple TV, and then decided to switch over to the CD version. To his surprise, he preferred the YouTube version. Subjectively, he thought it sounded more open. I was One eyebrow on my face goes up when somebody tells me sound is more open. Mm. I'm like, what does that mean? What do you mean by that? <laughs> more open, with more vitality, more powerful, and with an energy to the sound that got his attention. Why such a difference? Dynamic range compression. Yeah, <laughs> that's 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 the reason go. that we had the loudness wars uh, with recording uh, yeah. dynamic range compression on YouTube is almost certainly what was going on there, which, yeah, everything gets louder. Everything gets pumped up to essentially the maximum mm -hmm. level, which means, yeah, some quiet sounds in the original version, they're louder now. You hear them. They right. stand out more than they did in the original mix, but you don't get the difference between loud and soft that you do in uh, the mm -hmm. original mix that had wider dynamic range. So I might be wrong about that. That isn't necessarily true, but it's definitely the most likely culprit. Yeah, you're simply preferring the compression that uh, YouTube is applying. Yeah. You just like it. It's okay to like things that sound different and better to you, even if technically, supposedly, that's not the quote, That's why during the loudest words, all of the producers and all the artists are saying, make my album louder. Right. People like it. And radio stations are notorious right. for that. Uh, and I don't know if some stations may have backed off on it, but most pop, rock, alternative kind of stations, especially country stations, they slam that compression right. because the louder a signal is, the more it cuts through at the fringes of a signal That's right. out distant from the transmitter. So yeah, you're just enjoying uh, a little boost to the quiet stuff, probably. <laughs> um, whenever, he, continuing on with his questions, whenever people talk about Atmos, the focus always seems to be the overhead speakers and the sounds coming from overhead. But what if the sound mixers on a particular movie simply didn't place any sounds up there? Would it still be an Atmos mix? Well, yes, technically, mm -hmm. <laughs> just with blank channels up there. After watching some video about Atmos mixing, it seems to Gary that the real focus is on the more precise placement of sounds, including in the ear level speakers, and whatever gets sprinkled into the overhead speakers is just kind of a bonus. What do we say? I, some of that's entirely possible. It depends on how important it is to the people doing the sound for that particular movie, mm -hmm. what kind of movie it is. Yeah, no, on a, on a technical level, what's changed is object-based audio versus channel-based audio. And Atmos is a combination. Atmos still has channels. You can still put sounds into channels, fixed speaker locations, where all you're changing is, you know, the loudness between relative uh, speakers to pan sounds around that way. That's channel-based mixing. You can still do that with Atmos, and a lot of mixes do still do that. But on top of channel-based mixing, you can have object audio-based mixing, which is this uh, sound object that just exists in the soundtrack. Put it you know, wherever you want that data to be originally, and then it has metadata attached to it, which is essentially a, a set of coordinates and perhaps a vector attached to it saying, this is where the sound is emanating from in 3D space, and then this is where it's moving, and this is how much it's, you know, growing in diameter or shrinking. All of that is uh, produced as metadata. When you have an Atmos uh, decoder and an Atmos renderer, uh, it looks at that metadata and says, okay, now that I know all of these details about that sound object, you've told me what speakers you have in this room with our fixed speaker positions, what combination of speakers do I need to use to make the sound seem to do what the metadata told it to do? That's hmm. the way that object-based sound works. So 
yeah, you can have an at most mix. You could have it entirely made up of objects where none of those sound objects ever go to the overhead layer. They just all stay in the floor layer, but that is definitely still an Atmos mix. It could still be using object-based audio rather than channel-based audio. And yeah, it's entirely up to the mixers and masters how much or if they want to put any sound above you. Well, I feel like I'm learning as we're sitting here. And my understanding was the object-based process that you describe was on the producer's end as it gets encoded as a way to more precisely create the channels, but that on the user's end in my receiver, it's still just the number of channels, but it's much more accurate because of what it is. So you're saying my receiver literally is is finding objects in the mix and putting them where told. Yeah. Because that uh, seems enormous. Like what's the limit on the number of objects you can have? There's a certain amount of processing that would have to happen to do that. If oh, I yes. Had yeah, yeah. We, we, we talked about that a couple of episodes ago. Uh, you know, in the uh, uh, cinema mix, you can have uh, 64 simultaneous objects going on. In the home mix, uh, they bring that down to typically about 16 uh, okay. simultaneous objects uh, that mm-hmm. you could have playing. And the way that it's usually handled, handled in the home mix is they will actually just encode the bed level channels, the 7.1.4 channels, uh, as uh, even though they're, they're you know counted as objects in the uh, in the data mix, uh, those are just fixed positions that correspond to the traditional sure. channel positions that we're used to. And then you'll have you know typically only like four to six actual moving objects uh, in the home mix. Right. Yeah, the idea is that you've got this metadata attached to these sounds that's in that bed layer mix, and if you have an Atmos decoder and renderer, then based upon what speakers you've told your system that you have in your speaker configuration. I've got, you know, top middles and front heights or something like that. It's mm-hmm. going to do the best it can to make the sounds seem to emanate from where the metadata says those coordinates should be. That is insanely complicated. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Okay. I, I really misunderstood then. I thought all <laughs> the object-based was for the producers of the sound. And I mean, it to is. More precisely you know, they can, they can the, just say, I've got yeah. this stem, this one sound, and now I can yeah. choose in 3D space, literally with a joystick, where yes. I want that sound to come from, where it moves, and whether it gets bigger or smaller. You do all that in the mixing, but that's all just encoded as metadata to that one audio sound. And that gets decoded and rendered inside of your AV receiver on the other end. Well, there you go. Because Atmos hasn't become important for me yet, mm. uh, I haven't dug into it enough. Look at that. If you so have a trin off, all... you can watch little visualized blobs of the object moving around on a little display if you have a trin off. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, last week, we mentioned that with laser-based projectors, uh, once they eventually dim after years of use, you have to replace the whole projector since none of them offer just a laser replacement as of yet. But he's been using his LED light engine Runco projector for nine years now. When it was calibrated, it was set lower than its maximum light output, so it has some headroom to spare. And since he has it professionally calibrated every couple of years, he trusts that his calibrator will simply increase the light output setting to keep it looking its best as needed. So what's the basis for our worry about needing to replace the entire projector when it's lasers? If and when it actually starts to dim, just turn up the brightness. Does that work the same way with lasers? Well, yeah, I mean... It can to an extent. In a way, this is like asking why would you ever need to uh, replace the lamp in a lamp-based projector if when you initially set it, you had headroom to spare so you could just turn the lamp up higher once it starts to dim. Because you reach a maximum. Yeah. Yeah. In either case, you're going to reach the maximum it can get, and it'll still be dimmer than you want it to be, whether you're measuring it or just noticing it with your eyes. At some point, for example, if in the initial setup, you were already really close to the maximum light output in order to get the light values that you wanted coming off of your screen during the initial setup. Well, then right. as soon as any of those light sources starts to dim even a little bit, you don't have the headroom because you already had it set to maximum to begin with. Or mm-hmm. at some point, you're just going to reach the maximum. Now, LED light source, laser light source is going to take a lot longer to get a there than the lamp-based yeah. one. Mm-hmm. But you know, we're just saying eventually you will get there. If you're someone who your projector, your laser projector is your only display in the house and you use it eight to 10 hours a day, you're going to get to that 10,000, 15,000, 20,000 hour mark, you know, within the span of five, seven, 10 years, something in there. Um, right. You know, and, and at that point, 
you can't just replace only the laser, you have to replace the entire projector. When there is there is no more headroom to give it, there is no more brightness setting to turn up, you've already reached the maximum. Now, you can't just replace it. And I was saying, you know, when the cost difference between the lamp version and the laser version is $2,000, well, you know, that's going to be like four lamps in that time. I'm probably going right. to be able to replace the lamp a bunch of times for the cost difference and keep that projector at peak light output using a lamp based. So it's a value proposition. If the lamp and the laser cost the exact same amount i'd probably say yeah go ahead and get the laser because it is going to last longer than the lamp right right he has one more good question uh regarding sidewall reflections uh, we always seem to say to treat your first reflection points on your sidewalls and we always say to just use absorption but Dr. Floyd Toole has written and talked about the need and preference to retain sidewall reflections, and Gene from Audioholics seems to agree now, although he's installed diffusion panels at his sidewall reflection points. When Gary had his dedicated home theater built, his designer installed large diffusion plus absorption combo panels directly to his sidewalls after an acoustical analysis. So what is actually correct here <laughs> i still say correct is to absorb those reflections because they're not intended to hit your ears so i mean you know the the very clear answer is there is no truly right or wrong in this we don't have a strict standard the way we do in video in video we got lovely strict standards with exact mm -hmm. numbers that we can measure we can say exactly how far away from the standard you are in audio we just don't have that kind of strict standardization there is no real right or wrong to what you right. your sidewall reflections what i will mention is that predominantly in the tests that Dr. Floyd Toole was doing with Harmon, their research. Uh, first of all, they focused on mono playback because they were interested in what does it take to actually be able to hear the difference between speakers full stop. And it turned out that as, as soon as you have more than one speaker, it starts getting really hard for listeners to be able to tell speakers apart, even really? just stereo. And once you get to surround sound, forget it. You can have I believe it. big differences between speakers in poorly treated rooms and people can barely hear the difference when there's multiple sound sources going on so they went with sure. mono and then they were predominantly using music as the playback mm -hmm. and they were finding that people were preferring to retain the sidewall reflections when they were listening to music because it sounded more like bringing the instrument or the singers into the room where they already were they weren't doing this blind they had their eyes right. open so they're getting the visual cue of the room that they're in and mm -hmm. then they're saying when i play music out of a single speaker in front of me in this room if i take away the sidewall reflections there's a discontinuity between yeah, what a I'm mismatch hearing. between visual and audio that's sure. right. right yeah now this is a key point because there's essentially two you know, philosophies that I think of when it comes to recording and playing back sound, which is, do I want to bring the sounds into my listening room? And there's a lot of music that does that, right? Your studio recordings are essentially doing that. The studio right. recordings are uh, recording a very clean version of the sound coming from the instrument or the singer. There's right. not really much of any sort of room tone or resonance or reverberation included in the recording of the instrument because voices. it's not a live performance yeah. that happened in a specific space. You know, you've seen a recording yeah. studio. They're doing it in like a padded space. You're right. basically just getting the direct sound of the voice or the instrument going sure. into the microphone. You play that out of a speaker into a room where you're looking around and it's like you brought the instrument into your listening room. And so now we kind of want more reflections when we're listening to that because we don't get that discontinuity that way. We get this very direct sound from the recording of just the instrument and just the voice and there isn't much of a sense of space included in the recording right. itself. And now our room adds all that. Like when people say, hey, I can bring a piano or a saxophone or a singer into my room, have an untreated room, and I still recognize it's a piano or a saxophone or that of singer course. you yeah, know yeah. so why do i need to treat my room well you need to treat your room for the other philosophy which is i want to be virtually transported out of my listening room into the environment that you're trying to create. Now, of course, in home theater, that's usually what we're trying to do. We talk about Absolutely. blacking out our room so that we don't have the visual distraction and what we're seeing on screen. I got transported to that space station. I got transported to that right, fantasy right. land where people are, you know, walking around with a ring for six hours. Like, well, I got transported somewhere other than my room. And audio wise i want the same thing to happen because mm. movies and live concert recordings do include a bunch of audio information about the audio environment that's in the recording if i'm playing that back and then having my room contribute reflections of its own i get a discontinuity from that 
now I have two sets of reflections, the ones that's in the recording and the one my room is creating. So when I'm focusing on home theater, I prefer a deader room. I prefer a much higher ratio of direct sound from my speakers and very little reflected sound from my room contributing because I want to be virtually transported to wherever it is the recording is saying I'm right. supposed to be. Yeah, it, my philosophy will always be I want to see and hear what the director intended for me to see and right. hear. And the audio editors aren't editing for drywall. Right. They're they're editing for certain sounds to hit your ears. And so... Uh, yeah, I, I understand, though, same token, there, uh, a completely dead room is unsettling. Like, yeah. if you've never been in one, an anechoic chamber, it's creepy. So, I mean, that's where we, a... we sort of ended up, like, in Dolby's guidelines, yeah. where they're like, yeah, we want some reflected sound, generally in the sort of 200 to 300 millisecond range, pretty uniformly across the frequency range, Um you know, maybe a little bit starting to tip up in the deepest, best, maybe a little bit of a roll off in the treble, but generally pretty even RT60 decay times across the whole frequency range and around the, you know, 200 to 300 millisecond range. Whereas, you know, some music listening rooms where the only music you're listening to are studio recordings and you're trying to just bring that sound into the room, they'll have a much higher RT60 time, 500, mm -hmm. 600, sometimes, you know, getting close to a second RT60 times, really quite reverberant. Wouldn't be a great place to watch a movie or listen to a live concert recording but for studio recordings you know it's it's like you brought those instruments into the room so sure. it kind of makes sense in gary's case because he was trying to he, he explained he wanted to do both he wants to listen to music in here and watch movies in his theater so yeah. you know his uh acoustic designer was basically okay we're going to do these combo panels you're going to retain some of that sidewall reflection not you know a little bit more than if it was just purely absorption but we're going to knock down those sidewall reflections a lot because it's not as though diffusion adds reflections it right. also reduces the strength of the it softens it's not it, quite it as much as absorption only right. Your combo panels are definitely knocking down those sidewall reflections, but because it's all visually there, because your room is open, you're still not going to have a big discontinuity when you're listening to a studio recording. And that's the balance that I like. Right. I like that, you know, sort of even balance of, yeah, it doesn't seem out of place either way, but I fall right. more towards a higher ratio of direct sound to reflected sound because that tends to sound pretty good no matter what. I agree with you there. And you just have to uh, admit that, like, People, professionals mixing audio, whether for movies or music, they are mixing it for the most likely listening scenario mm -hmm. for the people they think are going to watch or listen to that. So a pop music is mixed differently uh, than jazz music yep. that are, that's played in a live venue. Yep. And so they know who's listening and they know the typical method of listening. So nowadays, unfortunately, so much pop music is mixed to be listened to on headphones because people are constantly mm -hmm. in their headphones. And that's where they, you know, and, and there's trendiness in certain EQs. <laughs> nowadays, everything is a thudding bass. Just a lot absolutely. of V-shaped smiley faces out there. A lot of that, yeah, boom sizzle is, is really popular, but that big, thick, thudding bass is really popular now, so you, you suffer from all that. So I just want the cleanest possible mm. sound into my head. That's what I want. Uh, let's move on to Eric. Uh, Eric put together his current home theater setup a while ago. He's got three Ascend speakers across the front with an SVS PB12 Plus subwoofer to make a 3.1 configuration. He's using an Optima HD 2080p projector with no real plans to upgrade it for a while yet. He's been using an HD resolution Roku with standard speed HDMI cables. He just picked up a Denon S760 AV receiver. It's new enough that it has three HDMI 2.1 ports and supports 4K 120 and 8K resolutions. Mm -hmm. Would there be any benefit to upgrading his Roku device at this point? What about upgrading his HDMI cables? Would either of those allow him to take any advantage of his new Denon's upscaling capabilities? Or should he just wait until he eventually upgrades his projector to upgrade any of those other things? My, my suspicion right off the bat is that uh, a better Roku, even if it is outputting the same resolution as an older, cheaper Roku, could possibly be using a higher bitrate stream. 
and get you a better 1080p? I don't know. I don't know for sure uh, if that would be the case, but just the experience of using it, it's going to be a little snappier. It's going to be uh, like true. a, a oh, little yeah. nicer navigating around. And since Roku devices are so inexpensive, uh, yeah. just on that level, I don't really have much of a problem saying, you know what, if you've only got an HD resolution Roku, going and getting a newer Roku device, it'll probably be kind of a nice experience. But until you upgrade your projector, you're not going to really see or notice any difference. Um, there's no reason. But I reason... do wonder, if, if, the, if, if you have the Roku Ultra that does 4K, mm -hmm. and you're watching the higher bitrate 4K stream, and then you let your Denon uh, well, scale it down to 1080p. Oh, down. Oh, I don't think that Denon does downscaling to 1080p okay. for the display. I'm pretty, like, you'd be setting the Roku. The Roku would detect it's connected to an HD resolution display, so mm -hmm. it would be setting itself to HD resolution okay, output. Uh, but you're right help. that it might still be bringing in a higher bitrate HD might stream. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it, it's not out of the question that, that having the, the newer Roku uh, might result in a visible difference. Uh, but there's no reason at this point for you to uh, replace your HDMI cables. Uh, when you do eventually get a 4K projector or a 4K display, you're going to need to upgrade your HDMI cables. If you were to upgrade them now to ultra high speed HDMI cables certified with the hologram and the QR code, uh, right. just to make sure that you're as future proof as you possibly can be, there's no downside, but there's also no performance upside for you right now. Right, right, you're right. just going to be having 1080p sent across those HDMI cables, no matter what in your current situation. Um, you're not going to be taking advantage of the Denon's upscaling because it, what's it going to upscale it to? It's stopping at 1080p. And right. that's what your Roku is already outputting. So um, there isn't really any advantage to have, but I don't have any problem saying, yeah, I think if you got a new Roku, it'd probably be a nice experience. And you might. Uh, we don't know for sure if you if there'll be any difference in the bandwidth of the streams that it's accepting, but it won't be worse. It won't get worse. And right. the just the menu navigation and everything will be snappier. So feel free. If you got it, you know, 50 bucks lying around, uh, snap up a new Roku device, but there's no need to replace any of it right now. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, Brannon has questions. First up, Brannon went with USG's ensemble acoustical drywall for the ceilings of his works showroom shop and an attached studio apartment that he'll have more questions about in a bit. This is perforated drywall that is installed on top of Owens Corning insulation and then has a special paint and texture mixture applied on the surface that keeps the look of normal drywall, but allows sound through to take advantage of the Owens Corning behind it for acoustic purposes. Uh, he is ecstatic with the results. That's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, I, ecstatic is a big word, man. That's great. Uh, since he did the installation himself, he had to travel to California for training on its installation, but he feels it was totally worth it. That's dedication. Mm -hmm. You travel to get the right training to install your DIY stuff. That's amazing. Obviously, it costs more than making DIY acoustic panels, but it's about half the price of other systems that maintain the look of drywall or plaster. And if you need to maintain the aesthetics and or you want to minimize the amount of square footage given up to acoustic treatments, he cannot recommend it highly enough. No more echoes in any of the rooms. Wow. And it's so easy to hold a conversation. Completely changes the feel and makes it so much nicer. It, you know, it makes me wonder if this is, is the perfect combination of absorption and diffusion, because uh, <laughs> the way he speaks of it, it, it is as though he has found just the right balance. Yeah, I mean, given that, of course, it's, you know, Owens Coney behind it. He was saying like in the uh, in his workspaces, he went with just two inch thick. So that's going to be treating the vocal range. But that's what he's worried about. Right. Bringing people right. into the showroom, bringing people into the shop, holding a conversation there. And now you can. It's not an echoey mess like it used to be, right, but it right. still looks like just flat drywall. So super happy there. He said in the studio apartment where he's staying sometimes, he went with three inch thick Owens Corning insulation. So that's getting mm. down, you know, more into that 250 hertz range, that type of thing, right. starting to get into the, into the musical range a little bit into the below the vocal range. So, yeah, depending on the uh, the absorption that you put back there, uh, you can maintain this nice drywall look. I, I like that. We'll keep that in our back pocket. Ensemble yeah, that's really interesting. drywall. I kind of want to learn more about that. His showroom location and his shop location are about two hours apart. The shop location has an attached studio apartment space. So rather than staying at a hotel, he uses that when he needs to stay there a couple of days every week. Due to building restrictions, he wasn't able to expand the apartment space. It's roughly 10 and a half feet by 16 and a half feet. And then there's a small kitchenette and bathroom to one side. One of the walls is a party wall to the shop. 
When they remodeled, he consulted with uh, Ted White from Soundproofing Company. He was great. And thanks to his advice, Brandon properly decoupled the ceiling and party wall of the apartments, installed double five-eighths drywall with green glue, addressed all flanking paths with new HVAC, and even created a small hallway to have some separation for the door between the apartment and the shop. Calling it soundproofing might be a stretch. Sound deadening would be a more accurate description, but he is really happy with the results. Back home, he has a dedicated home theater with an Epson 5050 UB on a 120-inch silver ticket screen and a Denon X3500H powering a 7.2.4 system with Ascend Sierra Horizon front speakers, Ascend Sierra Luna surrounds and surround backs with Boston Acoustics Soundware 4.5 speakers for the Atmos positions, along with a pair of rhythmic 15 inch subs. That is all some like AV rant approved gear right there. Seriously, like (laughs) even I am so familiar with these brand names. (laughs) And as other listeners might be. Now he wants to install something in the studio apartment that can keep up. He watches a lot of movies and plays a lot of games. He really digs Atmos, and he's kind of keen to try six overhead speakers, if possible, in the (laughs) studio apartment. But clearly, the studio apartment has other constraints to think about. Space is at a premium, so first and foremost, he's come up with two layouts for the furniture that he thinks might work. Which do we think is better? Putting the TV, a 77-inch OLED, on the short wall opposite the kitchen and bathroom and having the bed directly behind the couch? Or putting the TV on one of the long walls and having the couch right next to the kitchen with the bed over to the other side? Okay, that takes a lot of studying that's going to be uh, difficult to see if you're just listening to the podcast. We do have the diagrams on the YouTube version or in the Flickr album so that you can see what we're talking about. I think I think it sort of makes sense, though. Are we doing lengthwise or widthwise? Do we have the yes. kitchen behind us, kitchen and bathroom behind us on what would be the back wall? Mm-hmm. Or do we have the kitchen and the bathroom to our left-hand side? And we have the bed on the opposite side of the theater, sort of a, a side setup or a lengthwise setup. I like the symmetry for the audio of having the TV on the short wall. Indeed. And the bed behind the sofa. Yeah, I was going to say right. this is almost what are we prioritizing? Are we prioritizing the little theater area in this studio apartment? Or are we prioritizing the livability of the area of a whole? And we happen to have a home theater area right, side right. because I think that the lengthwise setup with the kitchen and the bathroom behind us on the back wall, the bed behind the sofa, which is facing the short wall that has the OLED on it. That's actually the better setup for the home theater. I like it better as just a studio apartment too. Do you? As you walk into the outside or to the shop, you're confronted with a sofa first and not a bed first. Yeah, it's like coming into the the living room area and then the bed's behind A little bit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was just thinking you are coming in, though, and immediately, like, even if these are on-wall speakers, immediately seeing a speaker and a TV on the wall. That's sure. instantly what you're seeing there. And then, you know, the yeah. bed right behind the sofa, like, you can only get out of bed on one side of the bed. <laughs> that's, what, yeah, you know, yeah. that's what's going on over there. But this is only a couple days a week, right? So. I'm, I'm looking at, you know, oh, yeah, and I mean, it's probably just going to be him in there. So, right. Yeah, I'm I'm leaning towards the lengthwise setup, exactly like Lee is. You know, and I mean this is this this is more bachelor thinking, I think, uh, yeah, yeah. to go with that route. But yeah, that's that's the one I would go with. Um, like Lee said, you've got better symmetry for the speaker layout. Uh, you've got space behind you this way. You don't have your sofa right against the back wall. I mean, he's you know planning to put a credenza behind the sofa if he did the widthwise setup, but that's still putting you know the back of the sofa very close to the back wall, essentially mm-hmm. running out of space to have any you know rear height speakers for Atmos right, purposes right. behind you. Whereas you've got plenty of space behind the sofa with the lengthwise setup. So we're both leaning that way, just keeping in mind, okay, you've made your walkways a little bit smaller. You're only getting out of bed on the one side unless you're crawling over the back of the sofa, if that's the way that you like to roll <laughs> out of bed. You know, there's a little bit of awkwardness I see in the lengthway side, but if really just you in there, then that's not going to matter. And yeah. audio-wise, uh, for those purposes, for setting up the speakers, yeah, we do the, the lengthwise setup. You could probably put just enough width between the back of the sofa and the bed to squeeze your legs in there to make the bed. Could be. Uh, maybe you could do something like that. Um, and I wonder if we'll be getting into the uh, the previously mentioned mono price small speakers might actually be good. Uh, he's included some proposed speaker positions in his rough sketches. 
Do they look about right? Do his front left and right speakers need to be wider apart? Do the Atmos speakers need to be a certain distance away from either the side walls or the back walls? Uh, there is access above the apartment, so dropping wires down to any location isn't a big problem. That's cool. Mm -hmm. And the gearer can go outside the apartment in the small hallway he created. He's already got multiple cable raceways going out to the hallway, so he's fairly free as far as speaker placement. How would we go about it? First of all, that's great that you can put the gear outside. Why mm -hmm. not? I say absolutely, because you need every little bit of space in here. Yeah, um, I, I think I'll actually start with the Atmos speaker positions, um, because, yeah, you, you generally want to have them about two feet away from any wall, you know, at, at sort of a minimum. That's sort of what we're aiming for. Now, the guideline is uh, take the width of your room, 10 and a half feet in this case, uh, take three quarters of that width, right? So that's what mm -hmm. about seven and a half feet a little seven bit more than seven and a half feet yeah, and that's about the distance apart now if you did that that's leaving you what about a foot and a half to each side wall so right. you know i like uh dolby's guideline is that they want the distance between your pairs of overhead speakers to be somewhere between one half and three quarters of the width of your room that's what okay. they're aiming for so i think if you basically put them about two feet off of each side wall that's going to be just about right you know, and he's going to be sitting in the middle of the couch looking at the middle of the TV. So that's fine. They're still going to be to the left and the right of you. And that's more or less where you're going to go. Now, as far as your front left and right speaker placement goes, that's just entirely going to depend on how far away does the couch actually end up being from the TV. Uh, that will determine what your field of view ends up being. And yeah. we're going to follow Dolby's guidelines and have those front left and right speakers somewhere in the range of 22 and a half to 30 degrees to either side of center, uh, which, you know, even if you're sitting, what he's saying, about six and a half feet from six a 77 and a inch OLED, yeah. that's about a 44, 45 degree field, field of view that you're getting, which means if those left and right speakers went, you know, basically directly to the size of the TV, what I would suggest is leave enough space for an 85 inch TV. Leave there enough space for that and then put the front <laughs> left and right speakers just to the outside of that because that's still going to be within the 22 and a half to 30 degrees to the left and right of center. That way, if you ever do want to go even bigger in here, you don't have to also <laughs> move your front left and right speakers, but you're not putting them so wide apart that they're too wide apart. Hey, do you want to go even bigger? <laughs> it's only hey, 10 man, and a half might. feet wide. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I guess I've, I've, I must keep remembering I've never met anyone that said, dang, I wish I got a smaller TV. Pretty much. I never met that person. Uh, let's see. Uh, I've lost my place for just a second. See, okay. I believe. Yeah. I have found my place now. <laughs> he really only cares about one seat, and it'll just be him in there. Yeah. So which single sub would we recommend? It'd be great if he could crush this space, about 1,800 cubic feet. But ideally, it would be as physically small as possible. So small, but still kicking your butt. Mm -hmm. Man, I recommend what we have in our living room. Some SVS yeah. SB2000. You bet. Yeah. The 2000 and Pro. Now's the time to grab one because they've got their Black, uh, Black Friday sale going. You can get the original SB2000, not the brand new mm -hmm. SB2000 Pro. So the original SB2000 did not have the SVS app, but you only got to set it up once. Uh, and they're going for 600 bucks right now for the SB2000. The SB2000 Pro is $900. That's a significant, that's 50% more. That's a big um, jump. To essentially just get the app. A little bit more output is coming out of that SB2000 Pro, but you don't right. really need it. So I I would hop on a Black Friday SVS SB2000 in terms wow. of the balance between having the output to crush this room, but the physically small size, you can't do better than that. Dude, that's perfect. Yeah. I think that's absolutely perfect. He wants to use on-wall speakers, and he'll install in ceilings with backer boxes for the overhead at most positions. Sounds good. Since he's very happy with his Ascend Sierra speakers at home, he naturally considered going with more Sierra Luna and Duo speakers. But since he can't avoid having speakers protruding into the walkways, even their compact 6-inch depth kind of sticks out a bit more than he'd like. He briefly considered Kef's T-Series, but doesn't really like their looks or sounds, so he quickly dismissed those. So, what about Focal's 300 Series on walls? He likes their looks, they're thinner than the Ascends, they're a bit expensive, but Accessories for Less has them at a price that's about the same as the Ascend Sierra speakers. We seem to be fans, but he hasn't heard them. Do we think they're the right choice, or do we have a different suggestion altogether? Wrong. Yeah, I think they're a great choice. Uh, those are really nice speakers. They're essentially using the sure. exact same drivers as the Aria series of speakers in Focal's lineup. They're just an on-wall version that they've called the on-wall 300 series. 
excellent, excellent speakers. If they have exactly the form factor that you want and the price is acceptable to you, I have no qualms uh, saying that you're going to enjoy them. And yeah, I mean, Focal is what I almost bought before I bought Ascensiera speakers because I could get the Ascensieras that I wanted for a lower price than the Focals that I wanted. Uh, wow. But they're they're right up there uh, with the Ascensiera speakers. I, I don't think you'd be disappointed in their sound at all if you went them. I will simply mention a potential alternative that right. costs a little bit less. I don't know know if you'll like the looks as much, uh, but Aperion has Novus series slim on-wall speakers. They have an MTM design, a simple two-way with just a tweeter and woofer design, or they also have a wedge-shaped speaker, you know, kind of similar to the SVS Prime mm. Elevation speakers that might serve well as on-ceilings for your Atmos, or if you end up mounting them high on a wall to serve as height speakers, uh, those wedge-shaped speakers can be very handy. So the prices on those are a little bit lower than the uh, Focal 300 series series on walls, uh, 650 each for the two ways, uh, 650 for a pair of the wedge shaped ones, or $1,000 each for the MTM design, uh, which is getting up there. That's that's getting close that's to the getting price. Up there. Uh, but these are more boxy shaped. They're wider. Uh, they aren't the super slim, you know, left to right uh, type of design that the 300 on walls are from Focal. So I don't know if you'll like their looks. They're available in some different finishes. Uh, but I'll just mention them as an alternative that sounds darn good, is still slim and on wall, and costs just a little bit less. The Focals, I, I dig that shape. Yeah. It looks more futuristic. It's going to look slicker to I me think that's in what a he's small space. End up with. <laughs> Probably so. And yeah, he's just want to make sure. So, uh, which AV receiver should he get? As mentioned, he's keen to try six overhead speakers if possible. <laughs> but in either layout, he isn't really planning on having surround back speakers. So, is there anything that allows for a 5.1.6 configuration that can also handle HDMI 2.1 switching. And I believe you're going to point him toward a Denon. Yeah, boy, are you in luck because uh, the X3800H just came out. It's $1,700. It's not inexpensive, but right. it can power nine speakers all on its own. It can process 11 and new for this year. It allows you to set your configuration as 5.2.6 instead Boom. of only 7.2.4 as 11 speakers. If you've got 11 speakers, Speakers. It can be five bed layer speakers and six overheads. That's new for this year, and there it is, and it has full HDMI 2.1 switching on all of its HDMI inputs and outputs. So there you go. There's no Boom. better choice. Uh, just a chef's kiss on that one. Mwah. Perfect. Uh, that, that's what a nice answer. <laughs> Let us move on to Jeremy's questions. Uh, Jeremy from Jay Porter Studios. For, uh, first up, Jeremy wanted to report back that he took our advice about acoustic panel placement for his showroom. He added four panels to his back wall and rear sidewall directly behind the seats. And then he made his sidewall treatment symmetrical with panels on both sidewalls beside the main speakers. To his ears, the sound is much improved. When you follow AV Rant advice, that's what happens. <laughs> Hopefully, that's what we're aiming for. <laughs> so he's got some good before and after pictures. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he had also asked about a projector upgrade. He attended Cedia, and now he's pretty sure he just needs to save up and go for a JVC. Hmm. Back at home in his living room, he's got a Marantz Slimline NR1607 receiver connecting to his 82-inch Samsung TV via a 30-foot monoprice high-speed HDMI cable. HDMI ARC and CEC were working perfectly. He could just use the Samsung remote and it would turn the Marantz on and off along with the TV and control the volume. He recently re-ran Odyssey and now the Marantz turns off along with the TV, but it doesn't turn on. He has to manually turn the Marantz every time now. Any ideas? What happened? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know what could have messed up unless maybe there was also a firmware update at the same time and it did uh, a bit of a reset in the settings, something along those lines. I'm not exactly sure how this setting would have changed, but in the Marantz, if you go into the settings, if you go into the video section, there is the HDMI setup section within there and it gets pretty granular in terms of what HDMI control uh, will take care of. There is a HDMI power section buried within there and you have to make sure it is set to all. What type of power gets controlled by HDMI CEC? All types of power, both uh, on and off. So that's about the only setting I can think of. There might be something in the Samsung TV. The Samsung doesn't get as granular as that. It's basically HDMI CEC on or off. You do have the ability to say, do you want this to power 
on devices and power it off, but that's just, it doesn't get granular of, you know, either on or off, it's just all or nothing. So you can check that too. But since the Marantz is powering off along with the Samsung, I think it's more likely that it's the granular setting in the Marantz that lets you choose that individually. And now you need to set the HDMI power to all in the settings, video, HDMI setup section. Sounds very likely that something just changed, like you said, in firmware. I don't know why, but yeah, it's, it's kind of got to be it. <laughs> it. It can happen. Weird things happen. It we sure have such can. complex systems nowadays. All right, let's move on to questions from Joseph. He is in Melbourne, Australia, listening to us upside down. <laughs> Last week, Joseph got our take on a projector choice for his big home theater with a big budget for his 184 inch wide, not diagonal screen sitting 19 feet away. Rob strongly recommended going with the Sony GTZ 380 10,000 lumen laser projector, which was kind of the way Joseph had been leaning anyway. But before he goes dropping the equivalent of 88,000 US dollars, <laughs> hang on <Yep>. a second, <laughs> just breathe on that one. <laughs> 88,000. He figured he'd double check a few things. Yes, let's double check a few things before we spend that money. For his associated equipment, he's got a Trinov Altitude 16 processor and a Mad VR Envy outboard video processor. That Mad VR Envy made an enormous difference, according to him, with his current SIM2 Nero projector on his 145 inch screen. The only thing missing is a Kaleidoscape which he'd love to get, but they're not available in Australia yet. So he's mostly using Apple movies with an Apple TV 4K. As mentioned last week, he wants a 184-inch widescreen, and he intends to go with a CinemaScope aspect ratio. While they are considerably more expensive, he was also considering a Barco DLP projector. And they have models with a native 5120 by 2160 resolution, 2.37 to 1 aspect ratio, versus the DCI 4K 4096 by 2160 <laughs> resolution, 1.89 to 1 aspect ratio of the Sony GTZ 380. Naturally, when he mentioned he intends to go with a CinemaScope screen, his Barco dealer told him the native 2.371 aspect ratio of the Barco projector would be better. Well, that's what the Barco dealer is going to tell you. <laughs> Joseph just wants the best image. Clearly, he does. Mm -hmm. With the Sony, does it have to? Uh, does he have it correct that it would be using its entire chip for 16 by 9 content, but only part of the chip for CinemaScope? That means he would be zooming the projector in for movies and zooming it back out for TV, correct? But with the Barco, he wouldn't need to do any zooming of the lens. Okay, we're we're over my head and way over my budget at this point. Okay, yeah, I mean th this isn't <laughs> as cut and dry as we're normally talking about for for less involved, less well healed home theaters because sure. he already has that Mad VR Envy, and that does make a difference in all of this uh, when you're talking about doing a CinemaScope setup. Now, first of all, the big big picture: Do you <laughs> always want your width to be maximized and your height? limited right because mm. if you ever watch any features that ha are in imax or have imax portions of them right so we get mm. the dark knight uh you know some right. of the mission impossible movies some of the you know hunger games movies uh the marvel movies that are on disney plus in the imax enhanced format right? right when you have these switching aspect ratios where it is actually supposed to be the cinemascope with and then get taller right christopher nolan's mm. movies um when, when you're watching those, they're supposed to stay the same width, but get taller for the IMAX portions. Now, yeah. with the Mad VR Envy, you, unlike most people, right? Most people, if they're setting up with a CinemaScope screen, when those IMAX portions hit, those top and bottom portions of the image get projected above and below their screen, or uh, they've had to put on an anamorphic lens and stretch everything, and uh, the okay. image just changes aspect ratio and actually gets... Uh, um, narrower when it switches to IMAX um, mm. on most people's setups, you have the Mad VR Envy, which is capable of making sure you always see all of the image, but it will do the thing where the IMAX portions end up the same height, but narrower. It's the opposite mm. of what was supposed to happen. The image was supposed to get even bigger when it went to IMAX. Right. In your case, it's going to get smaller. You're not going to run into the problem where part of the image is literally just being projected above and below the screen. And you're going to have, mm. you know, unless that's all blacked out, you're going to see a glow around your screen. You don't have to worry about that. But 
you will have the scenario where IMAX ends up being smaller than CinemaScope. So this is where I'm like, okay, the width, you know the width that you want. You're going by field of view. That's exactly what we recommend to do. Figure right. out the width of the screen you want. But I'm going to say, you're spending all this money. Do you not want the ability to have IMAX movies and IMAX portions of movies mm. to be even bigger than the cinema? I, I can't imagine he's not doing an acoustically transparent screen. So I'm not worried about uh, speaker placement. It's not going right. to affect that. I'm just saying you can have the experience with the Sony where IMAX gets bigger than CinemaScope. Now that means you're going to have black bars most of the time somewhere because sure. yeah. <laughs> yeah. even with 16 by nine content, because the Sony native resolution is actually a little bit wider than 16 by nine. It's not 3860 mm -hmm. by or 3840 by 2160. It's 4096 by 2160. It's a little bit right. wider. So even on 16 by nine content on the Sony, there's going to be little black bars on the left and right when you're showing that. And then yes, when you're playing CinemaScope content, A, your Mad VR can actually use the entire width of the Sony panel, the full 4096, but there will be black bars above and below. That That is going to happen. With the Runco and your Mad VR in there, it will always be able to fill the height of a CinemaScope screen. It's just going to keep changing the width. That's that's what, so. It's not as though you're always using all of the panel on the Barco, unless you're doing a crazy zoom thing where you're cropping off parts of the top and the bottom right, right. of a lot of images. But it's 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 not correct to think that movies are always CinemaScope. And That's only true. TV is 16 by 9. A whole mm -hmm. bunch of movies are 1.85 to 1, are 4 by 3 to 1, are 1.79, right. 1. 1 point, like all kinds of different aspect ratios are out there. We somehow got into this thinking that movies are always wider. It's not the case. There's a bunch mm -hmm. of movies that are, you know, closer to the HDTV shape. A bunch of movies are the cinema 4K shape, 4096 by 2160. So it's a choice. Uh, what I will tell you, though, outside of just how we're handling aspect ratios, because since you have that mad VR, you're good in either case. You're not running into the situation where you're going to literally not see part of the image. It's just right. that the yeah. size and the shape might be slightly different than what was really intended, but you're not going to miss out on anything. So you're okay either way. But the Sony has natively better black levels in contrast than the, uh, than the uh, Barco. And I'm okay. like, that to me makes the bigger difference. I would much rather mm -hmm. deal with uh, maybe some masking because you can afford a screen with some masking. <laughs> and you know, sure. the, the difference in price, because the the, uh, the uh, Barco is like $120,000. It's like forty thousand or you know $35,000 more than the Sony. If you don't already have a screen with mat, you're getting a new screen, making sure it's a new screen with masking. It'll cover, you know, the difference in price Perfect. will cover having that masking. I would encourage you to go for the big shape go for the the bigger uh closer to 16 by 9 shape so that imax can be even bigger than cinemascope and then have masking and rely on your mad vr to handle all of that i agree as i i don't have an experience in this level of home theater but uh, my same philosophy applies that uh i want to see what the director meant for yeah. me to see in the theater yeah. and if a thing that is happening nowadays is that imax portions go bigger up and down I want to be able to see that. That's what's supposed yeah, to like happen. It's when you're watching Dunkirk, smaller. do you want the IMAX things to get smaller? Like no. that doesn't feel right to me. <laughs> no. Well, it's just there. There's the old school feeling that you know there's something magical about you're watching the little previews and all of a sudden it's time for the movie and the curtains open left and right oh, and sure. the screen gets bigger. Like that's exciting. But I mean, with and an extra thirty-five thousand what... dollars, he could have motorized four-way masking on his. 184 yes. inch wide screen i mean that you can you can have you can have things mo moving around in all four directions how Man, fancy is yeah. that that's what i would want yep. if, if i could do this level of home theater i want what the director intends yep. i've felt that way ever since laser discs in the 1980s had letterboxed movies yeah and people wondered why i didn't want to see my whole tv screen <laughs> uh, you know why it's black at the top you can't see. okay i want to see what the director intended so uh, yeah, I, I agree with that uh, plan. Uh, moving on now to uh, Bastian. I'm going to hope I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, Bastian in Germany. Bastian will be moving. And for the first time ever, he gets to have a dedicated home theater room. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah. It won't be large, only uh, 11 by 13 and a half feet. That's fine. But he will have full light control, 
a single door in the middle of one of the short walls, a rectangular enclosed shape, and most of the time he'll be the only person in there. <laughs> Maybe it's, it's his little isolation chamber. Yes, just like me. go in and disappear <laughs> into a movie. Maybe a second person sometimes. Well, let's hope. Uh, but he'll be the one who cares about the sound quality and imaging and all of that. Uh, he has included a diagram for a rough idea of his proposed layout. The seating isn't to scale or necessarily shown where it will actually end up. So he's just given us the 4.1 meter by 3.3 meter. It's a rectangle shape. with a door in the, the middle doors? of one of the short walls and a, win and a couple of windows on the other short wall. And that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So you stick yourself and maybe an extra person in the middle. That's the right. The TV's on one of the little bit shorter walls uh, in front of windows, which you can easily control the light. That's from. right. So that's what's going on. Uh, so on that front, how do we think this room should be laid out? He has it lengthwise, but should he rotate everything 90 degrees so that the room is wider than it is long? Nah. How far should the TV be from the front wall? And how far should the seats be from the TV? He prefers a fairly wide field of view, about 45 degrees. He'll ask about specific TV models next, but he visited a big box store to look at 75-inch and 85-inch TVs. With the 75-inch size, he felt like he had to sit way too close to get the field of view that he likes, no farther than about seven and a half feet. And that felt too close for his preference. So he's strongly leaning towards the 85 inch size. How would everything be positioned and oriented in the room if that's the case? My first, the thing that pops into my head first is like, okay, do we have enough space on either side of an 85 inch TV to get the kind of speaker placement we want mm -hmm. and not have the speakers way up against the side walls? So is that the case? Uh, so, I mean, it, it will mean that uh, your speakers will be getting closer to the walls, but uh, as is going to come up later, he's got, he already has a bunch of DIY panels uh, and mm -hmm. they're all four inches thick and he has Perfect. base traps. So you can absolutely take care of any of those boundary concerns. You can have your front speakers quite close to the side walls, quite close to the front wall, and it's not yeah. going to be an issue in your case. Um, so I would definitely say in your case, yeah, you're going to go for the, you know, the 83, 85 inch size. If you go OLED, it's going to be 83. Um, but I would definitely uh -huh. go with that now. He's like seven and a half feet, just feeling wise. That's about as close as he would possibly ever want to get. Well, if you want a 45 degree field of view, you need to sit about seven and a half feet from an 85 inch screen. <laughs> now, but there I mean, you what? Go. we just got there, right? We just got there. Now, I get it because if he likes a 45 degree field of view from the 75 inch screen, he had to be six and a half feet away. Yeah, and he's, you know, that extra foot makes a difference when we're, when we're mm -hmm. talking about that. So oh, yeah. I'm going to suggest you have your seat so that your eyes are seven and a half feet away from your screen. We're going to go with an 83 or 85 inch screen size, right? So now if we're talking, the room is what, about 13 and a half feet long? Is that what we were saying? Uh, yeah. I, it's hard to switch back and forth. I'm looking at 4.1 <laughs> meter long, 3.3 meter wide. And but yeah, if, if I we're can going... conceive that, but I can't swap between the two in my head. <laughs> yes. 13 yeah. and a half feet by 11 feet. That's right. Yeah. If you're about 13 and a half feet, uh, long, um, what I would suggest is have about four feet of space behind your seat, right? So if you've got, a, like, acoustically, that's going to work out kind of nicely too, because you're going to be behind the halfway point of the length of this room. And and I'm going to suggest setting it up lengthwise, exactly like you've shown in your diagram. For a, mm -hmm. for a essentially single person theater, there's no reason not to do that. There's no reason to run into issues where, you know, where you want to place a sidewall panel might be the door or one of the windows, and you got to get a bit more creative with how those things are either standing or hung in front of those things. So I like your proposed layout for essentially a single person theater. There's no reason that 11 feet wide can't accommodate, you know, a, a love seat in there that's going to be perfectly reasonable sure to go with uh so yeah, if you have about four feet behind your seat uh then now we're talking you know about nine feet of space left give or take nine nine and a half feet something like that there's some you know depth to the seat back from where mm -hmm. your head is actually going to be so that means you know your tv is probably going to be the the screen itself maybe about two feet in front of those windows now i think that works out nicely because you're going to put some blackout curtains over those windows right. you're going to have a tv stand you can have the tv kind of towards the front of the tv stand and you can put some of your four inch thick absorption panels behind the tv and your center speaker so there's no mm -hmm. reason all of that can't work out really nicely so i say about about two feet uh from the uh from the screen of the tv to those windows on the wall and then you know about seven and a half feet from there and leaves you about four feet behind you yeah, I, I think the arrangement's looking good. Uh, with full light control and a dedicated room, he immediately figured he'd get an OLED. But price is a bit of a concern. 
The 83-inch LG C2 goes for about 4,600 euro, and that would really be stretching it. <laughs> but the 83-inch C1 can be had for around 3,500 euro. The 77-inch models are easily affordable for him for around 2,800 euro or less. But as he said earlier, he just doesn't feel like the 77-inch size will deliver the cinematic experience that he wants unless he sits too close for comfort. You're going to want the 83. Yep, that's fair. So... How much would he be giving up by getting the C1 instead of the newer C2? Does he need to worry about the little bit of extra brightness? No. <laughs> Is there some other TV entirely he should get instead? No. So <laughs> I I would say don't worry about the difference between the C1 and the C2. I'm sure, no, it's, Rob, you can it's tell minimal. me what difference I mean, there are. Every year, LG gets a little bit better, right? The processing sure. gets a little bit more powerful. They, they you know, write down at the, uh, you know, 2% black. It tends to get a little bit cleaner every year, right? We're really... Uh -huh. Picking nits as far as Boy, this goes. Literally nitpicking. For 1,100 euro in price difference, I would absolutely snap up a C1 while the yes. stock remains. The only thing I would say, he didn't mention whether gaming is a priority. If gaming is a mm -hmm. priority, get the C1. We're done. Don't even think about anything further. LG's OLEDs mm -hmm. are the best gaming displays. But if mm -hmm. this is movies first and I either don't play games or I play games casually, I really don't care about Dolby Vision in 4K 120. That's not going to make or break it to me. Then right. just check what the prices are on Sony's A90J because that was a really okay. excellent OLED as well. And if its price for the 83-inch size happens to be 100 euro less than the LG C1 or something like that, then... The, the A90J is an excellent TV from Sony as well, but the C1 is still better if you are a higher end gamer and you care about all the 4K 120 stuff. So one of those two. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, some, some extra notes here, as you just said, check yep. that Sony price. LG is better for gaming. For the speaker configuration, his intention is to keep it to just a 4.2 setup. A 4.2 setup. Yeah. Being the only person in there the majority of the time, does he need a center speaker? You know what I'm going to say. <laughs> His thinking is that he doesn't. Lee's thinking is that he does. <laughs> uh, he might add ceiling speakers in the future, but not now. He's got a Denon X2500H receiver on hand. Should he expand his plans to a 6.2 configuration with surround backs added? Again, I, I notice... If a, a phantom center channel for me only works if my head is locked in place with bolts yeah. in the center. If you as always soon as I move, sit upright I don't like and it. sit quite still, phantom yes. center works great. I mean, it really does. I, listen, I watch so much TV flopped over on one right. arm of the couch. Yeah. That's just how I live. Oh, that's fair and enough. I, I can't stand it as soon as it sounds like I'm hearing center voices from the left speaker, yeah. for instance. No, that's fair I enough. Just... Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that depends on Bastion a little bit, right? Because depending yes. on what seats he gets, depending on how he tends to sit and listen, if he's, you know, you're getting a recliner, he never really lays over on his side, he tends to sit quite still when he's listening to something, then Phantom Center works great. It seems like it he's can. kind of been living with that for now, and he's been fine but with it. he did say occasionally there's going to be a second person. Yep. Yep, yep. And you're going to be scooched over to the side and yeah. it might bug you. So, I mean, I really have no beef either way, personally. I think this depends a bit on, on yeah. Bastion and how you, uh, you know, tend to listen the most part. So I have no beef either way. I think Lee's reasoning is perfectly reasonable for Lee. He knows himself. Yeah. And so it makes right, a difference. Right. And I've got no beef with that decision either. Uh, I think it's because a pair of the speakers he's considering using that he already owns. There isn't really a matching center to go along with uh, those in a convenient form factor, but we're going to get to all of that. So sure. yeah, that that's my final answer as far as the uh, phantom center thing goes. Um, Surround backs. Does he need surround backs? Well, not if you go with the way you've shown things in your diagram. Uh, you don't need surround backs right. in that scenario. Like I say, I'm going to aim for having about four feet behind your seat. That would be about the absolute bare minimum where I might ever consider adding surround backs because otherwise they're just going to be distracting and too close to your head you can kind of do it i really don't think you need to also we're going to find out in just a moment bastion already owns a whole bunch of speakers so yeah try it <laughs> it's just <laughs> try it like it won't be a perfect timbre match <laughs> You might end yeah. up buying another pair of speakers if you t it turns out you really, really want it. But you have the ability to just try this. And uh, and that is absolutely my top advice. 
Right. So let's go through all the speakers this man has sitting That's around. Right. So <laughs> lots of different uh, pairs of speakers already on hand. So this are the these are the pairs of speakers. He has. Mm-hmm. JBL 4349 front ported studio monitors with 12 inch woofers and a compression tweeter and waveguide borrowed from the flagship JBL Pro M2 speakers. Also has Kef R3 three way bookshelves. Also has Revel Concerta 2 M16s. Also has Focal Aria 906, which was mentioned previously. Uh, Yamaha NS777 towers. Hey, hey, I got Yamaha towers. Uh, <laughs> DIY bookshelf speakers with 8-inch woofers and a tweeter in a waveguide. And then he has dual SVS SB2000 subs. Yes, got that too. A single PC2000 cylinder sub and lots of DIY 4-inch thick absorption panels as well as eight DIY bass traps. He ready to go. Yup. So <laughs> first of all, he thinks his JBL 4349 speakers are something special, but they are physically huge. Yup. He's curious what we think about them in general, and then whether we think it is feasible to use them as his front left and right speakers in here. Whatever speakers do not get used in the theater will get used in other rooms of the house, so he isn't opposed to whatever we think will work best. Now, I'm not familiar. How big are those speakers? This is not a big space. No, yeah. So, I mean, 12-inch woofers and yeah. then a good three inches more cabinet on either side of that. You so know, these so. are kind of like formatted like classic 80s, 90s uh, speakers. These are right? almost yeah. square. These are big rectangles. Yeah. Um, now, okay, what do I think of them in general? Well, the M2, uh, you know, flagships JBL Pro studio monitors might be the best speakers I know of. And I mean, they're expensive. Uh, You know, they're $10,000 each. Uh, That's including, (laughs) that's including amplification at least. (laughs) But, but, you know, that, that's the sort of price range, but I mean, that's not the most expensive speakers out there by a long shot. Oh no, no, they go crazy. Absolutely. Uh, And I mean, they're not pretty, uh, but you know, they're they're for professional purposes. Now Mm -hmm. the 43, uh, what what is the number on these ones? Uh, 4349s. Mm-hmm. You know, they're, uh, they're a passive version. They're a slightly downsized version because it's a 15 or might be even an 18 inch. I think it's a 15 inch driver in the M2s. Um, yeah. and so, you know, everything's downsized a little bit. I, I'm not actually sure if the 4349s use the dual diaphragm compression tweeter, but it's the same technology. It's at least the same compression tweeter design in the same uh, shaped waveguide. These are massive massive overkill for the room that you're proposing and they are yes. quite frankly just too large they're, they're just yeah. too big um yeah. you can't really you're you're hamstringing the speakers because they can't really be set up properly to take advantage mm. uh you know of all their capabilities and then you're just not utilizing what they're like these can play crazy loud they're, they're meant for really quite a large space they're meant for dubbing stages okay not mixing studios <laughs> okay. dubbing right, right. stages which is like a small commercial sized movie theater that's yeah. you know that's like these are meant to basically be the surround speakers in that world the m2s are the front three but you know that's mm. the sort of size of of space that they're intended for and they have that kind of output of uh, capability and efficiency so i mean i think they're fantastic speakers i don't think this is the right application from them i, I think you're kind of selling the speakers themselves short in this room and then hamstringing your home theater experience a little bit too because you can't set them up properly so looking at the speakers that you have i mean they're all great i mean i love the kefar series uh the the revel concerta twos are, are really tell it like it is wonderful linear speakers the focal arias you know some of my favorite speakers there out of those three pairs of speakers i have no idea what your diy speakers sound like and i probably wouldn't be putting the yeah those yamaha towers in here to mix with another pair of these other ones because he's like one of these are going to be my front pair one of these is going to be my rear pair we also want to consider maybe you will be adding the center speaker if you if you follow lee's advice um yes. so you know we want to all of these have the option of of uh you know whether you go with the kefs or the revels or the focals up front they all have center speaker options but yeah. out of those three i would say the revels and the focals sound the most similar to each other 
desk. So if I were going to do this setup using those existing speakers, personally, I would probably put those Focal Aria 906 speakers as my front left and right, maybe optionally get the matching Focal Aria center speaker to put below the TV, and then I would use the Revel Concerta M16 speakers as my surrounds. That would be my inclination. Now, I like the sound of that. Yeah. I, I love those Kef R-series speakers, but you know, as neutral as all of these are, those would be the ones where I might pick out a slight timbre uh, difference between those versus the Rebels and the Focals. Again, all of these are much more similar than different, but that's my inclination of, of the direction I would lean. Again, though, you have them all on hand, so there's no reason you can't try it for yourself, but that would be my inclination of where I would lean if you just don't want to spend the time doing that. Yeah. Right, right. And, uh, I, you know, I was just looking real quick to see if I could find, I know for a fact that uh, Yamaha made uh, a center channel that used the same tweeter as the uh, NS777 towers that he has. And they're not too deep. You could fit those in there. But I'm just because I'm a fan of Yamaha, yes. you know, <laughs> I, I like Yamaha speakers. Uh, that's what I have. I like Yamaha receivers. So I'm just trying to find a way to see if I can talk him into using that. But no, I like what you just <laughs> what you just said makes all the sense in the world. Well, and, and like, like I said, if you do have the time and you just want to have some fun, uh, absolutely. The best way to do it is to try things, including and go ahead drag those 4349s in there and give them a shot but you know it's just that's that's my thinking it through if i didn't yeah. have time to that's to not the right room it. for jbl speakers that big no 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 and i mean if you have if he's got an open family room great room or something like that there you go put those jbls in there they're gonna thrive right. in the open space you know if you've got a really nice just living room set up like those kefs and a nice living room setup they're gonna look like they probably look the nicest nicest out of all the speakers that you own so i would put mm -hmm. them where the aesthetics count more that's where i put the kefs so i'm just you know putting it all together I, I think that comes out with a logical plan that serves all the rooms in your house nicely. So, yeah, that's yes. that's my inclination. And I, I already mentioned he asked, you know, what which which pairs of speakers wear precisely. But I I think we did that with uh, the Focals up front and the Rebels as the surrounds. So yeah, uh, again, you know, you take another one of those pairs of speakers, try them as your surround backs, see if you really love them, and maybe you you keep them there or you end up buying something else to go somewhere. But I think that'll put you in good stead. Right on. Uh, hey, let's say we do another question from Jay. Oh, okay. I'm down then, if you're uh, okay. Let's do one more. I, I, I like challenging people who are in the two hour plus club. <laughs> let's see how plus you really can get. you keep up. I mean, if we go four hours, we have to call the doctor. But uh, uh, <laughs> let's do Jay's question. Let's show. That'll be it. All right. All right. Jay. Audioholics tested the NAD M23 Class D stereo amplifier, which is $3,750, and found it to have the lowest distortion figures of any amp they've ever reviewed, while also being load invariant, meaning it didn't have any of the pitfalls of previous Class D amps that would sometimes have trouble with certain speakers that have low impedance at treble frequencies. The M23 was ruler flat, regardless of the impedance, and delivered lots of power while remaining cool to the touch. So, if Class D is capable of being this good now, do we think more AV receiver manufacturers will transition away from traditional class AB designs? The benefits seem obvious, higher efficiency, less heat, lower weight. We've talked about the separate amps we own and how we love their quiet noise floor, but this NAD M23 measured exceedingly well in that area too. So if an AV receiver used class D amplification this good, even if it costs more, wouldn't that be worth it? And well, I mean, you're convincing me with your question. Does <laughs> if something sounds better and makes things more efficient, smaller, nicer looking, I'm for it. You're gonna have a hard time convincing a lot of hardcore old school folks that that little thin class D amplifier mm. is as good. You're just, they just don't like it as much, right? I just know how people sure. are. But uh, yeah, I mean, why not? I would sp personally, I would spend more for smaller components that sounded better. Mm. Because I, I, I don't get excited about a gigantic receiver that's like eight inches right. tall. I mean, it looks impressive. Oh, oh you and know, weighs you 100 pounds, like, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do, do the whole home improvement grunt. Oh, oh, oh. Yes, indeed. But it's just, it, I, I'm for the sound quality and I like it when things look sharp and minimalist. So I'd mm -hmm. be all over it. Yeah. I mean, I, I do uh, genuinely believe, yeah, uh, AV receivers, for as long as AV receivers, 
even continue to be a thing? Because I'm a little mm -hmm. bit worried. You know, we're starting to get to the point where, where just their mere existence is starting to seem a little bit questionable. Yeah, it's going to be a while. It's going to be a while, but we're, you know, we're seeing the number of brands that exist in that space dwindling every time. So, um, but I, I do think we're, we're going to be moving towards Class D. You know, Marantz, not in their AV receivers, but in their separates, their big 15 channel separates, because Ooh. they wanted to pack 15 channels of amplification into a single chassis for their separate solution went class D. You know, this is the first time yeah. we're seeing Denon and Marantz do that. I was anticipating that that uh, flagship Denon receiver 15 channel, 15 amplifiers built into the single chassis there, um, uh, uh, that A1H. I was expecting that to be class D amplification, if I'm being honest with you. Uh, turns mm -hmm. out it isn't. It's class AP with a gigantic Ooh. EI transformer in there. But um, I was I was expecting that to be class D and borrowing from what they're doing over at Morant. But I do think we're going to start moving this way. Now, the flip side of that is you do still have to do a whole bunch of engineering and filtering to make class D into this load invariant situation, right? Anthem mm -hmm. already did that decades ago or, or over a decade ago anyway their gigantic 1700 watt monoblock amplifier that they had ages ago was class d i mean it was the only way they could deliver that much power from a single monoblock um you know genuinely because the the anthem uh statement amplifiers uh could drive a short circuit that's how stable they were <laughs> You could, you could literally just put a piece of wire across the binding post and they wouldn't shut off. They would, would just, just drive it. melt the wire. <laughs> they would keep on going. So, you know, they had their monoblock and it was a class D and it was really expensive for that monoblock. Mm. Uh, but they, they already did it and it was load invariant back then. So NAD has now achieved that. But look at that price, right? It's a stereo amplifier. It's a two channel amplifier. Two channel. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. 200 watts per channel, which that's a lot of wattage, but it's not insane amounts of wattage we got 200 watt amplifiers that cost sure. less than three thousand seven hundred fifty dollars mm -hmm. so we're still talking about a lot of engineering and a lot of filtering needed in that class d design to get to this load invariant as stable as class a b already is for a lot less money so i don't think it's as simple as we can do it now so we're going to do it and we're going to get the prices down really quickly i, I right. it's going to be like you know pioneer has been using class d amplifiers and their av receivers for a long time now but they were load variant they had that thing where you test them with speakers that have wildly varying impedance and you would get non-linear frequency response out of the amplifier at that right, point right. it did matter what you attach them to but you know, those Class D amplifiers in the Pioneers were not nearly as advanced and heavily filtered and engineers as this NADM23, but mm -hmm. they also cost a whole lot less. They cost consumer AV receiver, you know, there amounts you of money. So I don't think it's as easy as flip a switch. It's like, it's not that we just figured out how to make a Class D amp this good. Uh, this is a lower price than it used to be. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the you know the engineering skill the technology to do it that already existed um like i say anthem statement had it at well over a decade ago so i still think it's going to take time to get there you have to also consider just the manufacturing side the scale uh you know economies of scale going on den and emirates are good at stamping out the class ab amplifiers that they've been using for years at a pretty darn low price they come on little almost like chip cards you know that yeah, that you yeah, can yeah, see inside yeah. when you look at the interiors and it's like they've been stamping those things out they've got the price on manufacturing those class ab chips about as low as they're going to go you know and to switch all that over to class d uh a the price will go up b it probably just simply cannot be as heavily filtered as this nad version otherwise the price is going to be astronomical and that's not where a sure. consumer av receiver brand is going to go so other brands you know uh arcam they've got class d they've got a class g amplifier because they're combining class d with a certain type of power supply um you know uh, anthem that they have you know some of the amplifiers not all of them they have different amplifiers for different channels right but the front three channels they got class a b and then the rest of the channels in there they went class d and a lot of their av receivers like uh, like the 1130 the mrx 1130 so yep it's creeping in there um and i think it'll be a while before we get to this level of performance we're gonna have to wait for economies of scale to catch up and everything like that Sure. But if the question is, do you want something that's smaller, looks sleeker, if it sounds just yeah. as good and you only have to spend a little bit more, 
then my answer is absolutely yes. And I yes. mean, if we look at all of the self-powered speakers, all of the wireless speakers, all of the whole whole uh, right. house audio speakers, all of that, those are all class D amplifiers built in. It's the only thing that really makes sense. Yeah. And there, you don't have to worry if the class D amplifier is load variant because you know exactly what speakers yeah. it's driving. It's only there driving that one speaker, right? So I've yeah. said for a long time, like Tom just last week, he was like, I don't really know if we're going to get to the all self-powered speaker setup where all of I our speakers so. have to be plugged into the wall. They're all self-powered and we just have preamps. We don't have AV receivers with amplifiers mm -hmm. built in anymore. And it's like, you know, I've been looking at that self-powered speaker future for a long time now. We do seem to be edging our way towards there little by little because we're getting all these speakers that are wireless and self-powered and it only makes sense. Eventually, you know, something along the lines of that is going to take over, but it's it's happening more slowly than I would have predicted going back six or seven years. So I think it all takes longer and I think it's because of that manufacturing and economies of scale side but of thing. I will say if you want to expand the world of home theater and get more people involved, mm -hmm. you do need to get away from big, ugly boxes. Yep. Uh, with a million connectors that people don't like that and you know, we it looks intimidating need... i i like it i don't care but what i'm looking for is the performance yeah. i'm not looking for a giant hulking box <laughs> and so if these class d amplifiers even if they have to be tuned to specific speakers and they're uh make you know wireless speakers i I'm for it because mm -hmm. I want more people to have good surround sound and a subwoofer. That's what I want. Yeah, we've got to find you, a way to get this this performance down to the consumer price. Yeah. That's, that's And it'll the get issue. there eventually, yeah. I think, because I think you sell more boxes when the boxes are prettier mm -hmm. and smaller or when there's no box at all. But as far as like if we're going to get to the all speakers are self-powered speakers and wireless, I'm like, we almost need to get to wireless power in our houses. Because as long as we have to plug <laughs> every single speaker into a power outlet, right. that's a lot of cords. And if you're you know open living room and you want surround speakers that are beside your coach, but your coach is in the middle of the room, where are the power cords plug in? You still got yeah. cords to worry about at that I, point. I kind of like the idea of just your rear speakers being uh, uh you know, wireless and plugged into an AC outlet. Mm -hmm. That's not so hard. And then the front speakers, it's very easy to run wires. To Usually, the front speakers. yeah. Usually. Usually. Yeah. Of course. So there, it's going to be a mix for a very long time. But I actually look forward to slicker, smaller, mm -hmm. nice performing things. So I hope it, I hope yeah. it expands. And I, I, I do genuinely believe we'll get there. Like I say, we're already seeing the transition start to happen. Yes. So, all right, we're going to cut it off there because we've gone crazy over our normal time. But that's yeah. what happens when Lee's around and he's able to because, you know, you're challenging not challenging the two hour club. Let's <laughs> challenge that two hour club. Come and on, still, who can handle it? Still have a couple of questions on the list from Nelson and Chris. They'll be first all up right. next week. Uh, but for the most part, that is it. We'll go back up to the top of the, top of the document here so that we can uh, thank our listeners of the week. And uh, yeah. Let's see here. Oh, I went too far. I went back up to my pictures there. Yeah, we've got uh, Joseph who <laughs> sent us a PayPal donation. And then we've got our uh, 139 patrons over at patreon.com slash AV Rant Podcast. One of those 139 patrons was Bastion from Germany. So thank you all very much for the financial support. Yes. And uh, uh, yeah, very, then very we've much. got uh, notes of gratitude just for keeping the podcast going through the times, as I'm just going to refer them now. So, <laughs> These uh, times. We thank you for thanking us. Those uh, notes came from Aris, Eric, Nick, Wayne, Brannon, Bastion, Greg, H, and Chris. Thank you all so much. And thank you to everybody who continues to listen and send in your questions. Of course, the place to send those questions is question at avrant.com, our email address. So uh, yeah, if folks want to get in touch with Lee, Overstreet, where can they find you, Lee? Uh, may as well still find me on Twitter at Lee Overtweet is the simplest way to do that. One day I'm getting the avrant.com address. You keep saying it. I just don't see it happening, but yeah. <laughs> oh, brutal. That's brutal. <laughs> gotta, gotta put in it. 20 years to get one. <laughs> gotta end it on a dig just like that. So uh, <laughs> yeah, there we go. On behalf of Tom and Andrew, I uh, hope everything has gone very well for him on his day off from the podcast this week. So uh, for AV Rant, I am Rob H. And I'm Lee Overstreet. Now go out and listen to something. <laughs>